Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Oh, great. So, uh, Bhutan is a uh, Bombay IIT and uh, now vice chairing the, the ACM uh, we, uh, women chapter. Wonderful. And uh, she is quite active and uh, taking charge of many. Oh, great. Uh, I think the YouTube live channel is on, so there is a lag. Can you please put off that? Can you please put the YouTube, sir? Can you please put off the YouTube live? Yeah. Uh, so I was uh, uh, introducing you with uh, Professor Bhutan, who is with us from ACM Women uh, mm -hmm. yeah. chapter, uh, ACM India Women chapter, uh, to be more precise. And Bhutan, here is our director, Professor K. S. Dasgupta. Hello, sir. Uh, hi, Nutan. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I hope I'm Fine. Good. Very nice to hear your voice. Thank you so much, sir. So, Nutan visited DICT once. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, sir, uh, so today's plan is something. So, now we will have the inauguration. So, once you inaugurate, then uh, Nutan will introduce us about the uh, activities of ACM and ACM Special Women Chapter and uh, so something like that. And then I will uh, brief this uh, school, the plan of the school for next 10 days, how we, we unfold the story gradually. And then we'll have our first lecture by Professor Tathagata Bandopadhyay today uh, from 4. So over to you, sir. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure and privilege uh, to participate in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, and a very unique program to create um, awareness among undergraduate and postgraduate women uh, in the area of NLP. A, a warm welcome on behalf of uh, uh, DICT, uh, 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 faculty members and myself. And in fact, I wish it would have been on campus but because of this pandemic, I believe uh, uh, we have to follow the new norms. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited because this is a very unique uh, event uh, and it is a very apt event where the women are being empowered to create and get an awareness in natural language processing. Because, you know, in our time, uh, these uh, subjects were not uh, existing. But now it is definitely uh, taking the front seat and it is moving at the rocket speed. Uh, so I believe uh, that we have uh, students, uh, uh, participants from outside India also, as well as uh, among India. So all of you, uh, I wish you a very happy new year. Of course, uh, you must have um, enjoyed your uh, new, uh, you know, happy new year and as well as uh, you are safe and fine. Uh, but I, f I find that the uniqueness of this program is uh, that, you know, you people will have hands-on uh, session because nowadays most of the time what happens is we know theory too much, but we don't have hands-on experience. 
and actually unless you know it is like cycling if you know the physics of cycling uh, but if you don't know uh, how to cycle because for myself i know how cycle works but i don't know cycling so unless you uh, scratch your hands and fingers and so on and so forth you will not be a good cyclist so this is a very good attempt from uh, uh, on on acm's part of it and i should congratulate and compliment uh, um, my colleague prasanjit majumdar his students and all of you uh, who are the member active members of this particular event uh, and i'm sure that uh, the participants will have a very fine time and participants uh, will be very very energetic and always uh, and also uh, they will ask a lot of questions because i believe uh, the faculty members who will be delivering in this particular program uh, are from renowned uh, uh, you know uh, um, uh, academician in the field of uh, um nlp uh, and i i know couple of faculty members who are good friend of mine like professor tathagata bandapadhyay professor pushpa bhattacharya and all the other uh, faculty members who are you know uh, uh, they are known because of their credentials so i uh, look forward that you know the all of you uh, participants you enjoy you ac you acquire certain knowledge and you also translate this knowledge into research potential and which will uh, make you very relevant and uh, in the modern uh, days of uh, uh, ai ml and data science and other related thing and i can assure you you some of you uh, do phd you are welcome to come to our institute and we have a lot of uh, facilities in the campus you can always uh, participate because we need bright young minds who can uh, carry out research in uh, information retrieval natural language processing but i i have one small request to you take it uh, if, as a uh, you know you try to understand the physical concept of it that is very very important because uh, understanding theory uh, you know it's like this linear algebra uh, if you want to understand you have to do some, solve some problems and you will try to uh, get the concept and i can assure you if your concept is good and your foundation is strong then you can take adventure you can do adventure in any new fields so with all the best wishes from my side from the institute side and i look forward that you know out of 50 uh, 40 students uh, 40 participants who are from india or even from abroad uh, uh, some of you can uh, come for phd program in our institute you can come for a different training whatever way you think you know our institute can uh, cooperate will cooperate and, uh, and try to make sure that uh, uh, we uh, uh, we can impart the knowledge what is essential because you know this sort of training is not it's one way it is a two way process that you get trained then you try to do advanced research and the faculties get good publications the visibility of the faculty as well as uh, yours is uh, is enhanced so with all this uh, uh, you know good wishes and also the best uh, um, you know uh, luck uh, uh, for this 10 days i'm sure you will enjoy and let us hope that some of you uh, will join us as a phd students if possible or an mtech students for undergraduate students if possible because the ambience is excellent faculty member credentials are very good and we have all the pot uh, potential uh, you know uh, labs and other things uh, so i wish you all the best uh, participants and look forward to have a closer better interaction with you thank you very much prasanjit and your team thank you sir uh, i would like to request nutan to introduce us with activities of acm largely and also acm women chapter acm india Uh, Shurupendu, can you please project? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, everybody, the faculty members and director of the AIICT, the participants of this workshop, welcome all. Um, so i am speaking on behalf of acmw india uh, acm is the one of the largest uh, bodies uh, that engages with the scientific community of computing in india 
and ACMW is the women chapter of that. Uh, so it was initiated in the US uh, to support, celebrate and encourage women. Um, we could go to the next slide. Uh, Association for Computing Machinery Council on Women in Computing. This is the full form. Uh, we are a part of, there are, uh, we have lots of members worldwide. And uh, you have, you may get some benefits by joining ACM or ACMW. You can become members of ACM and ACMW. Uh, this will allow you to uh, kind of keep track of various activities that go on, uh, participate in many of these activities, uh, get access to uh, top quality journals and uh, proceedings. So these are different advantages of being a part of the community. Uh, in any case, even without being a part of the community also, you can contribute, you can become uh, aware of the activities. Uh, so going over to the next slide. So the uh, mission that ACMW has is to, as I said already, is to support, celebrate, uh, and uh, advocate internationally for engagement of women. As we all know, uh, computing actually women were uh, kind of leaders when computing really took off, programming took off several decades ago. But uh, now as we see, uh, uh, there is little less presence of women, uh, I mean, lesser than we would desire in some of the fields of computing. And uh, in order to increase this, to increase a uh, number of role models for some of the students like you, uh, ACMW is always uh, trying to, uh, you know, put in efforts in the direction of uh, engaging more women and bringing more women into the fold. Thanks. Uh, so um, the important uh, events that happen across the year for ACMW, one of them is uh, celeb celebration events. So uh, you can look at ACMW webpage and you'll see celebration events are essentially events that are carried out by ACMW little chapters that open up in different cities. There is one active chapter in uh, Ahmedabad as well, uh, but there are lots of chapters in your, uh, there, you can look up a chapter close to your city. Uh, so there are these celebration events that happen where there can be a hackathon or a simple computing event that can happen. Uh, there are other uh, things such as this summer school for uh, women students like this one that happens every year since 2017. Uh, we also have an event for graduate women students, uh, which is called ACM India Grad Cohort. This happened in IIT Gandhinagar this year in, 20, uh, in the last year 2020. There are hackathon for uh, young women students. Uh, all these events have been started, uh, have started recently, but they are getting a lot of traction. We also give scholarships for women in computing to attend different uh, uh, conferences. For example, if you fall short on funds for attending an international conference, you could uh, uh, contact us. Um, so, uh, so we have, so the, we have, We've been around for quite some time. We have a lot of uh, women now in the circles. You could go to the next slide, actually. Uh, so overall, there are 180 chapters worldwide. Uh, there are 200 student chapters. Student chapters can be started by somebody like you in, uh, in the audience. Uh, there are 11 professional chapters. And uh, we are spread across different countries, as listed on the slide. Um, there are, as I said already, there are scholarship programs that we run. You can write to us. This needs to be taken to the global head, ACMW global head. This, these decisions are usually not taken in India, but certainly a lot of Indian uh, women have received support and you can definitely approach us. Uh, so usually around 50 awards are given per year. Uh, there are other smaller chapters that also support uh, various specific events. Uh, the members of ACMW are uh, Dr. Hina Timani, who is uh, who actually resides in uh, Gujarat itself, uh, in, close to Ahmedabad. Uh, uh, she is the chair and the vice chair. Uh, Ritupana Chaki from uh, Kolkata is the secretary. Uh, Arti, who is who used to be the chair, now has moved to uh, ACMW Global. 
and uh, we have many other women some from industry and some from academia uh, in our council so on our behalf uh, we are very happy that uh, professor prasenjit from dii city agreed to take up this uh, a mammoth event of uh, you know organizing this beautiful summer school for you and i'm very thankful to the administration and the director of dii city for all the support they have provided of course we would have all enjoyed if the event was in person uh, even more but uh, with the given constraints let's try to do the best we can i hope you learn a lot uh, as professor uh, uh, ksd was saying uh, hands on knowledge is what we hope to impart uh, through this uh, little workshop and i hope you have a lot of uh, wealth of knowledge that you'll take back with you so with that uh, without further ado i hand out hand it over to uh, professor prasenjit um thank you once again and enjoy your summer uh, winter work winter workshop thank you nutan yeah so uh, it was actually planned as a summer school sometime in the yeah, summer yeah, vacation summer school but yeah it's in fact a winter school now <laughs> yeah uh, but uh, the situation didn't allow us but yeah. the plan was to host a in person in campus summer school i know uh, but hope as as professor nutan said that we can do something similar in near future again so to before we start with uh, today's uh, technical sessions a uh, few words from uh, information retrieval lab dict so uh, ideally as uh, as the topic you see natural language processing uh, this is what we try to do in in the ir nlp lab at dict and when this uh, this point arises that there is an opportunity to to work with acm and to to do something uh, in in terms of offering courses so this was the topic that naturally came to our mind and and we try to gather uh, people around the country uh, who are into this this uh, research primarily from academia uh, to set up a school like this so to begin with these are the few points that i would just try to uh, put at the at the very first day and we will try to unfold the mysteries of these things eventually uh, so i mean uh, if 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 i uh, go back to my last point if you see i i try to put something which is called uh, a text generation now see, see i mean how things are connected so you all are familiar with chatbots so bots are supposed to answer all our queries so what is happening behind a kind of question answering system now what the answers are answers are generated texts because machine will have to generate a piece of text that is human comprehensible in human understandable as point 1 now point 2 is that sentence should be in context with what is been asked for so some parity about the question that was asked for now this is on real ground you'll see you can you can realize is very difficult for even human being even we many a times don't know what to answer and how to answer but you are expecting our machines can so if we have a module called text generation by whatever way it will be i know there are many technologies now coming up in your mind those who have uh, ventured little bit into this area you you are thinking of different language models you are you you are thinking of pre and post neuro, neural language models and so on but everything depends on how contextual it is how much semantic it makes and that's that's a, that's a real challenge uh, our our one point of caution is for all the machine learning systems the systems are as good as their training data so if you end up with not so bad training data you will end up with not so good i mean sorry not so good training data you will end up with not so good system uh now the uh, i mean you have a chatbot which can understand you 
it can ideally it should be able to understand you at speech level but purposely at this point of time we are excluding that but even if you have i imagine that you have a unique um, speech recognizer which which can understand all the accents and utterance and everything and it, it did a first class job but even then the text that you gather you have to make sense out of it that the, you have to find the question out of it you have to understand the intent out of it another problem is many a time that question that intent that text is not in a language that you know it may be a different language in a different language so so you see the challenge now got many got many fold so you, you have a question in chinese you have to answer it in gujarati and maybe your, your your client doesn't know either of the languages gujarati or chinese so to bridge all this gap this language divide technologies like machine translations are not very much in place now again what machine translation methodologies or state of the art things people are doing currently so these are some of the things that we will be talking in in next 10 days back up with uh, with labs uh labs will be of two type few labs will be live labs where you will have to uh share uh, your uh, your screen we can intervene into we can see what you are doing you can ask questions kind of thing or we will do something you can uh, together you, you can we can work it out together but they are live labs other than that there will be labs offline labs so the idea is you will have some take home assignments some of the take home assignments require a submission in next 6 to 8 hours maybe 10 hours so uh, once you submit it then you will be provided with the solution on the key so you can act kind of self evaluate yourself uh, if yes of course if you have any confusion we, we are always there to to help you out so there will be live lab there will be offline lab some self evaluation uh, will happen for for some of the assignments some of the assignments we will evaluate and at the end you will have a project so uh, eventually we will uh, we will uh, place the modules what we have in mind uh, that about, about the project but uh, before that as i said that the technologies as you see at the bottom like chatbot machine translation text generation heavily dependent on some of the uh, second tier mid tier technologies which 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 are essentially very hardcore nlp technologies like say postag without a postag you can't much proceed so now imagine there are 3000 languages now can we have 3000 postag in place with an f1 score of something like say 95 i mean 0.95 difficult i mean how will you scale it up each language is a world view so the world view is captured in 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 such a way but you can't ignore so uh postag parsers entity identifiers and several other leveling jobs so uh, so text can be seen essentially as a sequence of tokens initially sequence of characters now characters to words so sequence of words so leveling those sequences is is one major challenge in the kind of uh, a main one principal focus in 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 stuff like information extraction so once you have the that leveling thing done then how those entities or uh, snippets are get connected within each other in a large hypothetical imaginary knowledge graph if you think so that you can make some sense out of it so entity entity relationship and how that can be constructed over a, a set of languages so those technologies uh, will also be addressed whatever uh, amount of time uh, we have with us so you see the total uh, uh, the we we have a uh, we can offer it for 40 hours and you 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 must understand that i mean everything can't can't happen in 40 hours but certainly the most thought provoking questions that will help you to 
uh, to proceed more, to investigate yourself once the school is over, that would be the best takeaway for the school. That's how it's been designed. And then at the first tier, as I said, the middle tier, and then the first tier, if you can call it root, there lies the theory part of it. So theories are mostly in NLP are borrowed from, if you, if you can think in that way, from mathematics and from theoretical computer science. In theoretical computer science, uh, you have this automata and some uh, progression from, from automata to uh, I mean, finite state automata to more further uh, complex automatas. Uh, grammars, uh, contextual grammar, context-free grammars, and so on. That is, that is one major theory contribution to, to NLP. NLP draws its theory from there. And you have a large available field which is now growing, the machine learning uh, applications or machine learning find its application in NLP. In, in, in last 10 years, uh, the, the number is exponentially increasing. If you see that everywhere you see a neural model. So neural models and, and related mathematics hugely draws from linear algebra, probability, and optimization. So that is their one, what we say. So we try to smash uh, some of the uh, major uh, highlights of these mathematical treatments or mathematical happenings uh, in, in our first uh, three hours today that we will be starting. Um, at, at four, we'll be having delivered by, will be delivered by Professor Tathagata uh, Banjopadhyay. Uh, if you can see our uh, schedule here. So tomorrow we will have uh, the first taste of what we called uh, statistical language modeling. So statistical NLP, you can, you can have a, a tour into the, uh, into the world of language modeling. Uh, language modeling will be followed by, uh, for tomorrow and day after both the days, you'll have a hands-on Python lab. This will be a live lab where we will uh, try to introduce you with some of the very important libraries with libraries and environments through which uh, we'll be expecting you to do your project and other related assignments. And we have uh, courses uh, on parsing, uh, information retrieval, uh, uh, fair treatment on machine translation, if you see that is very much in the heart of, of natural language processing these days. And, and it, it, it takes from all the different modules. Then uh, text representation, how, how a text is represented, because see the art of abstraction is something that we are trying to develop within the machine. And we really don't know how we abstract text. We don't for certain represent text in our mind uh, in an alphabetically or word by word sequence, something like that. We just store the abstract thing, the content. So, so th that is uh, something we have to discover. We are still way, way behind what actually we, we are planning to do uh, technologically. And followed by that, we have dialogue management uh, systems. Uh, chatbot is one kind of dialogue management, which is very popular these days. Uh, and then we have two applications, one on social media analysis and the other one on text summarization, so automatic summarization. So again, the, the challenge in summarization is uh, how can you abstract a, a 600 page document, uh, which is human readable and comprehensible. So, so the challenges are pretty hard to break, uh, but it's, it's a fun if we all try together and if we can uh, contribute epsilon to the body of knowledge by some way or the other. Uh, that, would be, that would be a great fun and a sense of success. Uh, we will end with the project on the final day. That's, uh, that's the 15th of this month. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for making it happen once again. I believe all of us are here and those who registered. Uh, if anyone cannot, if you miss uh, this session, all the sessions will be recorded we will be available in recordings and those who could not join uh, in in the in this in the classroom 
uh, for them, uh, you must understand that we have certain constraints, resource constraint to do a few things, but uh, we try to reach you out through our YouTube live channel. So I hope uh, you can put your queries, your questions, those who are outside this classroom uh, there, and we will certainly collect them and uh, try to answer and try to address your queries. And those who are in the classroom, uh, when you are there, so just feel free, just raise your hand. We have all these options here and you can use the chat box also. So once you uh, have a question, you put it there and uh, accordingly we will address those questions. So thank you. Uh, we will be having our next session uh, at uh, 4 today, 4 p.m. today, a session on maths for natural language processing by Professor Tata Goto Bandopadhyay. Uh, Professor Bandopadhyay is the current Dean of Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, uh, a veteran mathematician and renowned statistician of the country who will take over uh, from four. Mm. Uh, Professor Prasenjit, uh, one yes. question. So every day will the YouTube link be made available at some web page or something? So suppose I want to... Yeah, so the plan is it's the same YouTube uh, live link, what I understand. I see. Uh, and what we have to do, we have to, we wrote it before, but we have to make sure that this live is available in the ACM website itself, in the school website itself. Yes, that would be very helpful actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now the registration link is no more required. Exactly. Exactly. So we can replace it with the YouTube live uh, link. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Badhopadhyay, uh, am I audible to you? Are you here? Uh, Bhargav, can you please unmute Professor Bandhupati? Yes. Okay, so, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Can hear you. So, I am. I will actually use two computers. Okay. The iPad and as well as my desktop. Desktop. Sure. So, but desktop, I clicked the link that you have sent, but it is saying join a meeting. Where should I go? Markov, uh, can you? Uh, uh, Sandeep, yeah. Sir, one minute, I'll give you access. Uh, another way is, Professor Bandhapadha, you can uh, see there is a meeting link and a password. Uh, that's what I did. <clears throat> because in iPad, I used the password and meeting ID. And okay. in desktop, I actually yeah. clicked the link. Sir, actually, two devices not allowed. I am allowing. But in that case, that would be a problem because... Yes, sir, I am allowing. Uh, you just allow me. So, uh, will you share your uh, whiteboard kind of thing with yes, us? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. I'll, that. I'll do that. I'll oh, do okay. that. So, that's why I am use, I will be using two computers. One yeah. for iPad for sharing the whiteboard and other computer for uh, basically seeing each of us. So, basically for communication, basically. Sure.
Uh, well, sir, actually, uh, we can only log in using one account in one device. Uh -huh. uh, but that won't be a problem. Uh, I am sharing my ID and password. Okay. You in the Zoom chat. So if you can log in using that, then it would won't be a problem. So, okay. So uh, tell me uh, ID. Yeah. Just just give me a minute. I'm 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 uh, sending you in chat. But you you think ID uh, password would be same, na? Huh? Yes, sir. Yes, everything will be same. Uh, so I am suppose I am entering meeting ID, the same meeting ID. In fact, you just allow me to enter. Uh, that's what. Acha, what Surupendu is telling, what I understand that if you have two different email IDs uh, aligned with Zoom, then uh, you can log in. Uh, from two different devices. I think that if I suppose I'm now joining meeting from an, another device, you you see that you uh, you have to allow me allow the host to. Yes, so, uh, Shurupendu, can you can you make uh, Professor Bandopadhyay co-host? Because of I session? always do that in my class. I use I allow my students also to uh, use two devices when they are writing something. Uh, I, I, as a host, I have to allow. Uh, for... hmm. can you make uh, Professor Bandhavada uh, co-host of this program? Yes, sir. Just, just a second. Uh, Bhargo, uh, can you make me a host if you? If it is no, Professor Bandhavada host. Yeah, yeah, sir. Actually, I'm also co-host, so I. I, I don't yeah, yeah, have yeah. A... Uh, it's okay. I think it has. It is what. It is what. Looks like. Okay. So can you see me? Yeah, we can see. Uh, but that's your tab. Uh, but can't you see my uh, desktop view? Uh, desktop view? No, no. I don't know. Why? Uh, Marga, you have to make the second ID as well the co-host. Uh, I don't see the co-host tag in that. But I can see my room but I can't see myself. I don't know. Now you are able to, both ID is closed now. Sir, you can share your desktop now. Uh, so I'm already there. So I have already shared my desktop. Should I again try to log in? Um, no, sir, that won't be required. I can see that you are logged in. Uh, the second login is uh, now visible and it is now a co-host. So, uh -huh. uh, you are, so you can now share the screen directly. Uh, I can share the screen, but can you see me? No, no, no. 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 Uh, that is what I'm saying, that yeah. you can't see me. Uh, they are maybe uh, what I understand. I mean, I don't no, know the data. I don't think that you, you are using, you are allowing me two device. It is the same device because when I am uh, using my iPad so that my face can be seen, I can see on my desktop. Uh, so you have not allowed me that. Participants, I, I can see, oh, host, okay. Uh, but here in co host, let me see more. Do you see a share screen option in that? It's not working. I don't see it.
let me again leave meeting join my next Meeting password. Okay, so but I am not allowed, it looks like. Uh, but uh, since you are the co host, you can actually set, uh, I mean, configure the setting also. Achha, where should I go in that case? Because I can't see the even the participants also. That is what. Uh... Because usually I get the link and I use that link to log in from two devices. One device I use for just to communicate, the other device I use for writing on, writing, the, writing on the board. Yes. But somehow it is not allowing me. So. I don't know what is happening. Is this a professional license? This is. Oh. But uh, yes, they, I, they, I have another hunch that there is something called webinar license. Maybe IIM has something called webinar, which has some different features. Oh. Achha, I can sign in. Uh, can you give me Pushpen, uh, Shurupendu, your email yes. ID and your uh, thing? Yes, I'll, sir. I'll, I'll uh, I have, I have uh, uh, sent you on the Zoom chat. Can you just look and uh, look? Uh, can you just see that one? Okay. Let me see. Or you can, uh, Shurupendu, you can WhatsApp that to. to, to, uh, to can you WhatsApp? Yeah. Well, uh, I don't have your phone number. I, I'll forward you. I'll forward you. Okay. Sir, I have sent you my... Uh, okay, ha, I, I... Let me see. So, it is Shurupendu, na? Yes, sir, yes. But yeah, in WhatsApp you sent? Uh, sir, in SMS. Uh, I think ah, I that's okay. what. I am, I am looking at WhatsApp. Yeah. In SMS? Yeah. Okay. Acha. So, okay. So, now I got it. Let me try. Zero.
password. Okay. Signed in, but and what should I do? Uh, sir, you have to then join, uh, select join meet. Join a meeting, na? Yes. Acha, then I will give meeting ID. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Nine eight seven. Meeting registration, it's asking for meeting registration. <laughs> the passcode or uh, is it? Just first name, last name, meeting registration, um, that, it is asking that, for. That's not correct. Uh, okay, one second. Meeting registration pending approval. I registered also. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, uh, did uh, you uh, log in using my ID uh, earlier, or uh, like did you just select join me straight away? No, sir. when there is a sign in option, mm -hmm. uh, and then I went to sign in, and then Shurupendu Ganguli. I am. I can. I have already signed in as Shurupendu Ganguli, uh, and now sign me out from our device show so join a meeting i can go to join a meeting i went to join a meeting then it asked for meeting id then i gave meeting id and then it was asking to register asking me to register uh, then asking me to register 
ओके या आर यू ऑलरेडी यूजिंग द सेम आईडी आई थिंक देन इट्स अ प्रॉब्लम पॉसिबली दे वोंट अलाउ uh well sir actually it's logged out from every other device and it's already approved so that should not be happening that's why i asked the steps uh ah, i did exactly what i did sign in use your uh login and password and then i joined and when i joined they are asking me to register okay uh okay sir just just a moment अनम्यूट कर लाम कोरे स्क्रीन शेयर कर दीजिए हाँ स्क्रीन इज़ विज़िबल सर या यू आर विज़िबल या विज़िबल थैंक यू थैंक यू आपने अपनी शुरू कर दी ओके सर ओके ओके सो आई थिंक वी आर इलेवन मिनट्स बिहाइंड द स्केड्यूल सो सॉरी फॉर ऑल द प्रॉब्लम्स सो 
I don't know how many of you are here in uh, this uh, class because I can't see any one of you. All your videos are off. Is it because you have a internet problem or is it because you don't want to show your face to us? I think it's better if you just put your video on so that we can communicate. Otherwise, we don't feeling like a class. Otherwise, I am talking to some a computer, basically, a computer screen. Huh? So uh, it, is, it is better if we can communicate, if you can ask questions, and then we can communicate that much. That's much better. At least the classroom feeling comes. Otherwise, it's not like a classroom feeling. Huh? So I request you all to put your video on so that we can communicate. Okay, so uh, I was asked to uh, talk a little bit about the basic mathematics and statistics uh, probability that you will need to understand uh, natural language processing theory, different, different models and different things. So uh, what I would say that initially I will say that uh, you possibly will learn something called uh, word to vec, something like this, maybe, okay. Word to vec, you will possibly learn this model which is used in NLP a lot. I think it is one of the very important models that they use. So there, actually, word is, word is considered as a vector, as a vector. And then you need to use different concepts of, uh, concepts related to vector, vector space, similarity of vectors, uh, basis of a vector space, and as well as uh, matrices. So with this introduction, I will go straight to the properties of a vector and uh, uh, basically the properties, I will not get into much of technicality because I think within three hours, it's impossible to cover everything which is technical. I will more emphasize on the conceptual part of the uh, discussion. So uh, with uh, diagram and with small examples, I will try to explain you uh, the basic concepts uh, of vectors and matrices, which you will require uh, in when you will uh, be exposed to different models for NLP. And once we are done with that, then what we will do, we will take a break of 10 to 15 minutes. And after that, we will start uh, certain concepts on probability theory. That also you will need in your subsequent sessions. OK, so what is a vector? Usually, vector is often called, uh, we call a position vector, position vector. So what is this? Suppose you are considering uh, a two-dimensional space and this is say x1, this is x2, and suppose this is a point one, one, and if you draw a line segment up to the point one, one, so this is a vector. This is a vector because it is it has a direction as, as well as it has a magnitude, it has a length, and this vector is 1, 1, or sometimes I will write 1, 1. So sometimes I will write it as a row, or sometimes I will write it as a column. So this is a column representation of vector, and this is a row representation of vector. OK. So this is a vector. A vector is a directed line segment from origin to the point. And now 
uh, the question is in general in general you can see that this this i have written in two dimensional space but in general we will talk about n dimensional space and n dimensional space a vector will look like something like uh, a1 a2 up to an if i write it as a column or if i write it as a row it will look like a1 a2 an and for column vector i will use something like say alpha if i use alpha and a curl below that and then the row vector would be alpha transpose that's the standard notation that we use okay okay so okay so now the question is there are a few concepts associated with, associated with a vector the basic concepts for example what is the length of a vector what is the length of a vector similarly we may be interested to know um, what is the angle between two vectors angle between two vectors then we may be interested to know how two vectors can be added or subtracted from one another we may be interested to know multiplication of a vector multiplication of a vector by a scalar we may be interested to know multiplication of two vectors so these are some basic concepts that we would require so you see that when i am saying length of a vector length of a vector means suppose this is the vector and you can easily see what is the length of this vector length of this vector by pythagoras theorem is 1 square plus 1 square square root of that so in general when i am talking about an n dimensional vector alpha then length is denoted with this notation alpha norm which is naturally if you generalize that it will be a1 square plus a2 square plus an square so this is the length of a vector okay and then suppose i have to find the angle between two vectors so angle between two vectors means suppose i have one vector which is 1 1 and another vector which is say uh, 1 2 this is 1 2 so i want to find the angle between these two vectors which is theta say so in general i will say if i have a vector alpha which is a1 a2 up to an and beta is another vector which is b1 to bn then what is the angle between alpha and beta so angle suppose i am denoting by theta angle between alpha and beta so one can see that actually this angle would be cos of this angle cos theta would be equal to a1 b1 plus a2 b2 plus an bn divided by the norm of a and norm of b so this is the definition of uh, angle between two vectors so cos of the angle between two vectors alpha and beta would be a1 b1 that is component wise you are multiplying a1 b1 a2 b2 up to an bn divided by norm of a and norm of b so this is the definition for angle between actually one can prove it very easily but i am not getting into the technical things 
this is the concept is this if there are two vectors and the angle between these vectors is theta then cos of the cos of theta is equal to exactly equal to this this is rigorously one can prove that very easily okay so now you see that very interesting thing suppose theta equal to 0 so what does it mean this means cos theta would be 1 and cos theta equal to 1 means then you will have something like that uh, theta equal to 0 is not uh, an inter in interesting idea. Let's consider cos theta equal to 0. Cos theta equal to 0 means what? It means that the numerator a1, b1 plus a n, b n is equal to 0. The numerator should be 0. And if this is true, then we say that alpha and beta, these vectors are orthogonal. They are perpendicular to each other because cos theta equal to 0, it will happen when? Cos theta equal to 0 means theta equal to 90 degree. So that means if two vectors are perpendicular to each other, then if you take the component wise, if you multiply component wise and then, then add it, then it will be equal to 0. So this is the condition for two vectors to be perpendicular. Okay. And there are another interesting thing I can tell you. So okay. Okay, so now another interesting thing I can show you. Suppose you have data on two variables and these are paired data, x1, x2, xn up to x1, y1, x2, y2 up to xn, yn. So this is the data set. So suppose x is the height and y is weight. So x1, y1 is the height and weight of the first person. xn, yn is the weight and height, height and weight of the nth person. So n could be any number, maybe 100 individuals. So I have observed the heights and weights of 100 individuals. So now I need to calculate the correlation coefficient r. This is the correlation between height and weight. Suppose from this data, I, I would like to calculate the correlation coefficient between height and weight. So do you know the formula for correlation coefficient? Any one of you know? Any idea? Have you encountered correlation coefficient? How to calculate correlation coefficient from data like this, paired data? Anyone? Please tell me because I have to get an idea how much you know and how much you don't know. Do you know or if you don't know, then also you can say, okay, we don't know. That's fine. Sir, we need to find out the uh, mean of all x and then all y. And then uh, we write down summation of uh, xi minus x mean uh, into uh, yi minus y mean uh, divided by square root of uh, those uh, multiplication of those summations again.
Uh, sir, you are in mute. So summation xi minus x bar times summation yi minus y bar, then square root of summation xi minus x bar whole square and yi minus y bar whole square. This is what you are saying? Correlation coefficient? Yes, sir. Okay. So, and you know that uh, R, this correlation coefficient lies between plus one and minus one. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if correlation coefficient, if correlation coefficient is zero, what does it mean? Uh, so it means that the data and the column X and Y is not at all related. Exactly. So it means basically there is no relation between X and Y. And that's why correlation coefficient is zero. To be more precise, I will say there is no linear correlation. Okay. Because we can give you an example where there is the X and Y are exactly uh, non-linearly related, but still correlation coefficient could be zero. So correlation coefficient is a measure of linear relation. That means as X increases, whether Y increases or Y decreases. Okay. So there is no linear relation. So now, if you think about this, I consider two vector x1 minus x bar, x2 minus x bar to xn minus x bar. And another vector y1 minus y bar, y2 minus y bar, yn minus y bar. And if I consider the angle between these two as theta, then what is cos theta? Cos theta is correlation coefficient R. Correlation. It is R. Yes, sir. Okay. So you can see that correlation coefficient and the angle between two vectors are kind of related. You have to define the vector properly. So if I define one vector this, the other vector this, then I see between these two vectors, if the angle is theta, then cos theta is r. And if r equal to zero, that means the vectors are perpendicular. They are perpendicular. And then if the vectors are perpendicular, these two vectors, then I will say there is no correlation between x and y. So this is another way of looking at correlation coefficient. Second, let me do one thing. Let me fix this. Yes. Now you see that we talked about that we need to talk about the addition of two vectors. Addition and subtraction is possible. Addition and subtraction of two vectors are possible when the dimension of the vectors are same. So what does it mean? Suppose I am saying one vector is one, one, two. The other vector is one, two. So this is a three dimensional vector. And this is a two dimensional vector. So you cannot add or subtract a three dimensional vector and a two-dimensional vector. So if you have to add or subtract, you have to have two vectors of same dimension. So for example, if I have alpha, which is a1 to an, and beta equal to b1 to bn, then alpha plus minus beta would be equal to a1 plus minus B1 to An plus minus Bn. Okay, so component-wise, you just add or subtract. Similarly, if you have to multiply a vector by a scalar, suppose C is a scalar, and I am multiplying alpha by C, then it means that you multiply each of the component by C. This is the vector C alpha. Okay, 
so that means if you have to do c1 alpha or c alpha plus d beta what does it mean it is c a1 plus d b1 up to c an plus d bn so this is the vector which is c alpha plus d beta similarly suppose i am interested to multiply two vectors alpha and beta so there are two kinds of multiplication so we will only consider what is known as scalar multiplication of two vectors scalar multiplication scalar multiplication of two vectors so that is defined as suppose alpha is one vector and beta is another vector so we denote it by alpha transpose beta why i am saying alpha transpose beta because alpha transpose means i am writing it as a row vector a1 a2 an and writing beta as a column vector b1 b2 bn so this is a row vector and this is a column vector if i write like this then this this will say this is the scalar multiplication of alpha and beta and what we get is nothing but a1 b1 plus a n b n which is the numerator of cos theta so this is the definition of scalar multiplication of two vectors alpha and beta so if the vectors alpha and beta are a1 a2 an and b1 b2 bn then the scalar multiply multiplication of alpha and beta is given by alpha transpose beta why i am writing alpha transpose beta that will be clear later so first vector i am writing as row second vector i am writing as column and if i multiply this then the definition is i will just multiply component wise and what i will get which is basically the numerator of cos theta you can easily see that this can be alternatively written as beta transpose alpha also it is same thing if you write beta as rho and alpha as column you will get again b1 a1 plus b2 a2 plus b n n so alpha transpose beta and beta transpose alpha are both same okay so but the rule is that whichever vector you are writing first you take transpose of that and the latter vector you write as a column so a row vector multiplied by a column vector will give you and of course the dimension of the vector should be same then you can get a uh, scalar multiplication of two vectors okay so up to this it is clear so you see that let's recapitulate what we discussed we first of all introduced the concept of a vector as a line segment joining the origin to the point and its direction is towards the point okay and then we talked about the length of a vector angle between two vectors so length of a vector you know if alpha is a1 a2 an then the length of a is square root of a1 square plus a2 square plus an square and the angle between two vectors and alpha and beta if it is theta then cos theta equal to basically i i can now say i can now write that cos theta equal to alpha transpose beta divided by norm of alpha times norm of beta so this is the definition i can now say because alpha transpose beta is basically component wise you multiply and add that is the scalar multiplication of two vectors and then you divide it divide this by the norm of the two vectors so that is the angle of two angle between two vectors and we know that if cos theta equal to 0 then theta equal to 90 degree then alpha transpose beta should be 0 and alpha transpose beta should be when it is when it is 0 then we say that the two vectors alpha and beta are perpendicular to each other or in um, vector matrix jargon we say they are orthogonal alpha and beta are orthogonal to each other okay and then we discussed about 
the relationship between the correlation coefficient of two variables, a pair of variables x and y, and the angle between the two vectors. If you define the vectors properly, then you can see actually correlation coefficient is the angle between these two vectors, x1 minus x bar to xn minus x bar and y1 minus y bar to yn minus y bar. And then we define the addition and subtraction of two vectors. What you need to remember that addition and subtraction of two vectors is possible only when the vectors are of same dimension. And secondly, we define if you multiply a vector by a scalar C, then what you are getting, every component will be multiplied by C. That is the new vector that you are getting. That is a scalar multiplication of a vector by a scalar. And then scalar multiplication of two vectors we have defined, which is nothing but alpha transpose beta or beta transpose alpha. So first you need to write the vectors, whichever vector you take as a row vector, and then you multiply it with a column vector, and that will give you, it's a notation basically that we are using, and that will give you the scalar multiplication of two vectors. Is this clear? Okay. Any question? Sir. Yes. Sir, uh, uh, we see that if the correlation coefficient is zero, that means that two quantities have no relation mutually. Exactly. So in vectors, cos theta is considered as the correlation coefficient. So yes. if cos theta is zero, then the vectors uh, don't share a relation mutually, right, sir? So Basically, what does it say? Suppose this is alpha and this is beta. It says that these two vectors, one is say this is alpha. Okay, this mm -hmm. is alpha. The other vector is beta. Okay. And if these two vectors are orthogonal, perpendicular to each other, if these two vectors are perpendicular to each other, that is equivalent to saying that X and Y have no relationship, no linear relationship. So, so can we say all mutually perpendicular vectors are linearly independent of each other? Yes, of course, I will come to, but linear independence is a different concept. I will come to that. Uh, linear independence of vectors. Of course, orthogonal vectors are linearly independent. That's true, we'll see. Any other question? Sir, uh, what is norm? Norm is the length of a vector. So okay. we have already defined length of a vector. Suppose if alpha is the vector, norm of alpha is square root of the component square and sum of that, a1 square plus a2 square plus an square. That's the norm. OK. And what is the um, the curve symbol which we are putting, uh, subscripting under every so vector? Always, alpha? because to distinguish, distinguish between a scalar and a vector, always you need to put a curl sign at the bottom of the vector. For example, when I am writing C alpha, C is a scalar, so there is no curl at the bottom, but alpha is a vector. So from this, I can easily see that C is a scalar, alpha is a vector. We, we call it curl. Curl, curl, yes. Curl, curl, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, any other question? Is it, is it fine? Can you go to the next topic? Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, thank sir. you. Thank you. I need, actually, it should not be one way delivery. I, I want your feedback also. Huh? So if you find uh, that you have not understood something, you just, you can just tell me. Okay. There is no issue. Okay, what is happening? I don't know. I have to use, change the, okay. Maybe I will stop share this, again share screen. I cannot change the whiteboard. I don't know in this new iPad what they have done. Okay, so now, 
let's discuss a very important concept which is called linear independence so suppose i have now m vectors alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m a set of m vectors so how i am defining alpha 1 i am saying that alpha 1 equal to a11 a12 up to a1n alpha 2 equal to a21 a22 a2n and alpha m equal to am1 a m2 a m n so i have and each vector is n dimensional so alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m m vectors of dimension n so these are n dimensional vectors okay so now we say that this set of vectors this set is linearly independent linearly independent if none of the vectors can be expressed as a linear combination of others a set of vectors is said to be linearly independent if none of the vectors in the set can be expressed as a linear combination of the others so let's try to understand what does it mean suppose i have i consider two dimensional vectors so 1 0 0 1 and 1 1 these are three two dimensional vectors so now you can easily see this is a dependent set why this is a dependent set 1 1 can be expressed as linear combination of 1 0 and 0 1 exactly if you add 1 0 and 0 1 you are getting 1 1 so that means 1 1 can be expressed as a linear combination of the two other vectors similarly you can actually express 1 0 as a linear combination of 0 1 and 1 1 for example suppose c1 0 1 plus c2 One one equal to one zero. Now the question is, what would be the values of C one C two? So you see, you, it does. It means that C this is C one times zero. Okay, so C one times zero plus C one times one is the first vector. The second vector is C two times one. C two times one equal to one zero. So if I add these two vector, what I am getting? C two, C one plus C two, equal to one and zero. Now, what does it mean? That means C two equal to one and C one plus C two equal to zero. Since C two equal to one, so C one equal to minus one. So that means if you take minus one times zero one plus Minus one times zero one plus c two is one, so one times one one. Then what are you getting? You are getting one zero. So that means in these three vectors, any two of them can express the other. Okay, but if I consider one zero and zero one. can we express one as a linear combination of the other no sir 
No, no. sir. No, sir. Similarly, one one zero one. So that means any two vectors, if you take, it will be linearly independent. But once you go to three vectors, what you find that any 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 one of them can be expressed as a linear combination of the others. So these three vectors are linearly dependent. But if I set, I take a set of two vectors out of this, then these would be linearly independent. Now the question is, in two-dimensional space, if I ask you, in two-dimensional space, what is the maximum number of linearly independent vectors that we can have? Two, sir. In two-dimensional space, what is the maximum number of linearly independent vectors we can have if we consider two dimensional vectors? Oh. You see, suppose two dimensional vector is something like A1 and A2, okay? A1 and A2. Now, if I consider two vector, one as one zero, the other as 0, 1, then you can say that A1 plus 1, 0, A2 plus 0, 1 will give you A1, A2. So that means any two-dimensional vector can be expressed as a linear combination of 1, 0 and 0, 1. Yes, sir. Okay. So if you have to express a two-dimensional vector, then two linearly independent vectors would be enough. And that is exactly what you need. You need two in linearly independent vectors for expressing all two-dimensional vectors. Okay. So now I will say that then I will say that for a two-dimensional space, at the most, we can have two linearly independent vectors. And this is called this set of vectors is called set of vectors called is called the basis of the two dimensional space. I'll come to the definition of basis more clearly. Hmm. So in general, I can say in general, in general, for n-dimensional space, how many vectors I need in a basis? N. 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 Because clearly you see that if I define something like E1 equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, E2 equal to 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and En equal to 0, 0, 1. Then any vector, say A1, A2, An, A1, A2, A3, An, can be expressed as A1 times E1 plus A2 times E2 plus An times En. So that means, but, and these vectors, you can see they are linearly independent because none of them can be expressed as a linear combination of the others. Why? Because in the first vector, first component is non-zero, others are zero. In the second vector, second component is non-zero, others are zero. In the nth vector, nth component is non-zero, others are zero. So that means, E1 cannot be expressed as a linear combination of the others because in all other vectors, the first component is zero. Whatever you multiply, you will get zero. You will not get one. So that means in general for an n-dimensional space, 
if you have to get all n dimensional vectors then it is enough to have n linearly independent vectors which form the basis of the general n dimensional space is it okay is it fine yes sir okay. yes sir now let's define what is called the vector space vector space is defined in this way suppose v is a vector space v is a vector space and the definition of vector space is it's a basically a set of vectors a set of vectors and suppose two vectors alpha and beta if they belong to v if it is a vector vector space that means any linear combination of alpha and beta will also belong to v okay so if two vectors in vector space if we pick up two vectors and take any linear combination of those two vectors then it will also belong to v if the set of vectors have has this kind of property then we call it a vector space for example let's look at this let's consider two dimensional space so 1 0 is this vector and 0 1 is this vector can you tell me if i consider the vector space that is generated by these two vectors 1 0 and 0 1 then what kind would be the all possible vectors in v the 2d whole one one exactly the 2d whole space the two dimensional space is the vector space okay because from these two vectors you can get any two dimensional vector and if in your v that two dimensional vector is not there that means it's not a vector space so vector space should contain all linear combinations of vectors alpha and beta if alpha and beta belongs to v then all linear combinations should belong to v okay so that is how we define the vector space of and you see that i am now giving you an example suppose i have 110100010010 these are the three vectors okay and suppose i am trying to understand what is the vector space that these three vectors if i take all linear combinations of these what is the vector space they can generate it is see i have to consider a three dimensional space and 100 0 is say this 010 is say this and 110 should be something like this so basically you see 110 is sum of these two vectors it's a linear combination of this that means in this case the vector space is a subspace of the three dimensional space this is this plane this plane is the vector space which is spanned by this but on the other hand you can see this is i am saying this is spanning set spanning set of b but in the spanning set what i can see the two vectors are linearly independent third vector is linearly dependent on the others so the spanning set and the basis what is the difference between basis of v and spanning set of b means in basis you will have only the linearly independent vectors for example to span this v this vector space how many linearly independent vectors i need Two. I need two, two, two vectors. My basis may be different. For example, for this vector space, one zero zero 
zero one zero is a basis. Again, one zero zero one one zero can be another basis. So that means basis vectors are not unique. But on the other hand, number of vectors in the basis is unique. That means to span this vector space V, you need exactly two linearly independent vectors. So number of vectors in a basis should be unique, although the basis vectors may not be unique. Okay, and number of vectors in a basis of V is often called the rank of the vector space, rank of V. So what is the rank of a vector space? Rank of a vector space means you try to find a basis of that vector space. Basis means what? You to try to find a set of linearly independent vectors that will generate or span that vector space. And how many vectors are there? That is the rank of that vector space. Is it okay? Sir. Hello. Any any question? Yes, sir. Ah, tell me. Clear. Uh, spanning of the vector space is a subset of the dimension. Clear. I can't hear you properly. Your voice ah. is breaking. Sorry, uh, sir. The spanning set of V ah. is a subset of the three-dimensional space. No, spanning set of V is basically these three vectors. This set of three vectors span okay. the subset of this three-dimensional space. Span. So spanning okay. set are the set of these three vectors, which span a subset of the three-dimensional space. Okay. But in this spanning set, hmm. there are two vectors which are linearly independent. Third one is linearly dependent on the other two. Okay. So if I have to get the basis of the same vector space, I need only two vectors. So the basis and spanning set, the difference is this. In a spanning mm -hmm. set, you may have linearly dependent vectors also. Spanning the same okay. vector space. But okay. in a basis, you can only include the linearly independent vectors that spans B. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yes, sir. So, huh, yes. So, so over here, the spanning set can also have more vectors uh, yes, where it yes. covers the same sub part of the two dimensional space. Exactly. So, okay. for example, suppose you have a basis for V and spanning set may contain, besides basis, many other linear combinations of the basis vectors. Okay. Okay. So basis, I will say, is the minimal spanning set. Okay. That is the minimum number of vectors that will have to be included in a spanning set of a vector space is the basis. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other question? Sir? Yes. Sir, when we have basis for a vector space, why do we need spanning set separately, sir? So these are basically just definitions. I'm talking about that a vector space can be spanned by a set of vectors. And that set of vectors may be dependent, may be linearly independent. If the set of vectors is a set of linearly dependent vectors, then we'll say it's a spanning set. But basis is the minimal spanning set. That means all the vectors in a spanning set, if they are linearly independent, then we will call that spanning set as the basis. Is it fine? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now let me discuss another interesting thing. So what we found, it is important to note here that basis is not unique. But 
number of vectors in a basis is unique. That is the rank of a vector space is unique, which is the number of vectors in a basis. Okay. Okay, so now let's go to orthogonal basis. Suppose I have again several vectors. Suppose I consider these vectors, two dimensional space and I am considering these vectors, 1, 1, 1, minus 1. So what are these vectors? 1, 1 is this vector. And 1 minus 1 is this vector. And the angle between this is 90 degree, clearly. So these are orthogonal vectors. OK, so now you see that these two vectors also can span the whole two-dimensional vector space. So, I will say this is an orthogonal basis of V, the two-dimensional vector space. An orthogonal, orthogonal is this sign, that means perpendicular. An orthogonal basis of V is given by this. But if I consider another basis, 1, 0, 1, 1, this is also spans the whole two-dimensional vector space, but not an orthogonal basis. Okay. So what is an orthogonal basis? Orthogonal basis means if the vectors in the basis are orthogonal to each other. Okay. So then I will say this is an orthogonal basis. Okay. And one can actually if you give me this basis, which is not orthogonal, I can actually generate from this an orthogonal basis by a procedure called Gram's mid orthogonalization procedure. I can find that. Okay, if you give me a basis, I can find an orthogonal basis from that easily. Okay, so let me explain possibly. Suppose I am saying this is alpha and this is beta. So this is not an orthogonal basis, but this is a basis. So suppose from this I have to generate an orthogonal basis. What I will do, I am defining alpha star equal to alpha and beta star equal to alpha star equal to alpha beta star equal to alpha star minus c times c times beta and i am defining this new vector such that alpha star and beta star are orthogonal okay so now you see that the way I defined alpha star is, it is alpha, okay? So alpha star, alpha means it is one zero. And how did I define beta star? Beta star is alpha star, that means one zero minus C times beta. What is beta? Beta is one one. So what I am getting? 1 minus c times 1. So the first component would be 1 minus c. The second component would be 0 minus c times 1. So it would be minus c. So now if alpha star and beta star, they have to be orthogonal. So what is the condition? Can you tell me what I need to check? Because c I have not specified yet. I have to choose c such that alpha star and beta star are orthogonal. So what I need to do? What is the, the scalar multiplication? Scalar multiplication of alpha scalar star and multiple. beta star. One times one minus c plus zero times 
minus c would be equal to 0. So that means 1 minus c equal to 0. So that means c should be equal to 1. And if c you take as 1, then what is your beta star? Beta star is alpha star, which is 1, 0 minus c times 1, 1. And what you are getting? 1 minus 1 is 0, 0 minus 1. So alpha star is 1, 0, and beta star is 0 minus 1. Clearly, these are orthogonal to each other. So that means given any basis, you can generate an orthogonal basis by a similar procedure. It can be extended to any number of vectors which is known as gram speed orthogonalization procedure. OK? Yes, OK. Sir. So now let's come to the concept of matrix. Any any question up to this? Sir? Huh? So what is the significance of orthogonal basis? Like, why that? Orthogonal basis is actually, if you think about the two-dimensional vector space, the orthogonal basis would be one vector would be like this, the other vector would be orthogonal to this. If you consider a three-dimensional vector space, the orthogonal basis would be if one is this, the other is this, other is this. Okay, so we'll see that orthogonal basis will have, will play, will play a very good role in, in, in the later discussion. So when you have all the basis vectors orthogonal to each other, it means exactly this. Yeah. But what is its use? We'll see later, a little later. You have okay. to wait. So now I am considering matrix. Matrix is defined as a Ortho and a rectangular array of numbers. So you can see this is a matrix of order, we'll say N cross M. N is number of rows. And M is number of columns. So matrix is a rectangular array of real numbers. And I will assume that all A, A that is the all, these are called elements. All elements or all numbers inside the matrices are real numbers. Hmm. I'll always consider it real. So now you see that if I consider, sometimes matrix is also defined as vector of vectors. Why? Because you see that I can write this as something like alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha m, or beta 1 transpose, beta 2 transpose, beta n transpose. You see that what is alpha one? Alpha one is this column. This is the column vector. Alpha two is the next column. And alpha m is the mth column. So I can write it as a vector of column vectors. And similarly, beta one transpose is the first row. This is beta one transpose. This is beta two transpose. And this is beta n transpose. So I can write it as a vector of column vectors or as a vector of row vectors. So that's why sometimes matrix is called vector of vectors. Now you see that this alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha m, these columns generate a vector space. If you take all linear combinations of these vectors, 
then you will get a set of vectors and that is the vector space generated by alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m and alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m may not be linearly independent so alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m are the m column vectors take all possible linear combinations of these columns you will get what is known as a column space it is a vector space which is known as column space suppose this matrix i denote by a this is the column space of a that is the vector space generated by the columns of a is called column space of a similarly i can also generate all kind of vectors by taking linear combination of beta 1 beta 2 and beta n and then i will get another vector space and that i call row space of a row space of a is the vector space generated by the rows of the matrix a column space of a is the vector space generated by the columns of the matrix a what is interesting you see that the column space are generated by n dimensional vectors because each column is n dimensional and row space is generated by m direction m dimensional vectors so basically they are two different vector space for example n could be 2 m could be 3 so the column space is a two dimensional vector space generated by the columns and row space is a three dimensional vector space generated by rows so row space and vector space their dimensions could be very different now the interesting most intriguing result more counterintuitive most counterintuitive result that i have found in vector in matrix is this that rank of the column space of the matrix a equal to rank of the row space of the matrix a what does it mean what does it mean it means, it means that basis no basis space Basis. The number of vectors uh, Vector. for the basis of row space is equal to the number of vectors for the basis of column space. So can I say that by extending a logic a little bit, can I say the number of column vectors which are linearly independent? So number of linearly independent column vectors is equal to number of linearly independent row vectors? Yes. Yes, yes sir. Yes. So that means the number of linearly independent columns equal to number of linearly independent rows. And then this we call the rank of the matrix A. So rank of a matrix A is nothing but rank of its column space or rank of its row space. Both are equal. Okay. So this is how we define rank of a matrix. Now let's we, let's come to what is called linear homogeneous equation. Okay. So let's consider this. So you see, this is a set of n equations in m unknowns. A set of n equations in m unknowns. What are the unknowns? Unknowns are x1, x2, xm. This is called a linear homogeneous equation. Linear homogeneous it is called because on this side it is zero. That is why it is called homogeneous. And if on the right hand side you allow it to be non-zero, then it is called non-homogeneous. 
So linear homogeneous equation looks like this in general. N equations in M unknowns. That is the number of unknowns and number of equations may be different, okay. So now you see, can I write this as x1 alpha 1 to xm alpha m equal to is null vector. Null vector is a vector with all zero. So can I write this in this form? Your alpha 1 is this vector. And alpha n m is this vector. So I am multiplying alpha 1 by x1, alpha 2 by x2, alpha m by xm, and then I am equating with null vector. I am getting the same set of equations. OK? So suppose alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha m are linearly independent. That is, all columns are linearly independent then can you tell me what is the solution of this equation? That is, what are the values of x1, x2, xm? So, zero. zero. So, if I say x1, x2, xm, all should be zero? That is the unique solution I have? Does it make sense? I am yes. saying that except this, there is no possible solution for this set of equations. Would you agree? Yes, sir. No, sir. Why should you agree? Why shouldn't you contradict? No, you? sir. Suppose all are, all are not zero. One is not zero. Two, one non-zero means other another. At least two should be non-zero. If two are non-zero, what does it mean? That means one of the yeah, alpha can, can be written as Yes, sir. So that means it is contradicting linear independence. Yes. So if the columns are linearly independent, then you have only one solution, which is all x's are zero. And if they are linearly dependent, then how many solutions are possible? How many solutions are possible? Infinite, sir. Infinite. Infinite. Infinite number of solutions are possible. Because you see that if you get two solutions, then any linear combination of the solutions will also be a solution. So basically, one can easily see that in case of linear homogeneous equation, either you have one solution, which are all zero, or if it is if the columns are linearly dependent, then you have infinite number of solutions. Okay. So now, suppose instead of linear homogeneous equation, instead of null, I consider this to be a vector b, which is non-null. Then can you tell me that when can I say that this system of equation has a solution? When the uh, vectors are linearly dependent, sir. So what does it mean? Can I say that if B belongs to column space of A, if B belongs to column space of A, then I can express B as a linear combination of the column vectors. But yes, if B doesn't yes. belong to the column space of A, I cannot, ex I cannot uh, express it as a linear combination of the column vectors. Yes. So that. This is the condition for a system of linear homo non-homogeneous equation to be consistent. That means there is a solution. Then we say the system of equations 
is consistent. Okay. Okay. So now let's consider square matrix. Uh, any question? Sir, can you please repeat? Uh, so I am saying, let's uh, take yeah. an example, very simple example. Suppose I am Mr. saying my alpha one is one zero. Zero. One zero zero. Alpha two is uh, zero one zero. Or maybe one one zero. One one zero. And B is zero zero one. So I am considering X one alpha one plus X two alpha two equal to B. This equation I am considering. And you see that what I am saying, I am saying one zero zero and one one zero. I will take a linear combination of these two and I want to find zero zero one. Is it possible? A linear combination of one zero zero and one one zero can it give you a vector like zero zero one? Is it possible to get this vector as a linear combination of these two? No, sir. No, sir. No. no. So that means this equation is not solvable. It is not consistent. Only when this part that B belongs to the column space generated by these two vectors, then only I can express it as a linear combination of the columns vectors. And then it is consistent. That is what I am saying. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, got it? Is it fine? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So let's now consider square matrix, which is very important for us. What is a square matrix? Square matrix means N equal to M. That is number of rows and number of columns in the matrix are same. Okay. And a square matrix is often called, it is a symmetric matrix. If A is equal to often called its transpose. So what is A transpose? So suppose A is a matrix like this. A is A11 a12, A1n, A21, A22, A2n, An1, An2, Ann. It is a square matrix. What is A transpose? A transpose is the matrix where the first row would be the first column. And second row would be the second column. And nth row would be the nth column. And when A equal to A transpose, then we say the matrix is symmetric. That is, if you change column, interchange column and row, the matrix will remain same. For example, if you consider a matrix like 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, Five zero zero six. You can see that the first row and first column are same. Second row and second column are same. Third row and third column are same. So it's a symmetric matrix. Okay. So you might have a, what is very important in your discussion, sometimes you will see that square symmetric matrix. Okay. Now, there is another interest, important concept which is called a matrix A is said to be non-singular. A is said to be non-singular non if there exists a matrix A inverse such that 
a inverse a equal to a a inverse equal to an identity matrix n so let me explain first of all i have to explain how to multiply two matrices and then i have to explain what is identity matrix so suppose i have to i have two matrices a i have already defined a11 etc and b i define as b define as b11 b12 b1n to bn1 bn2 bnn suppose i am defining the product of two square matrix of odd same order but of course the multiplication can be done even if it is not of same order so just for the sake of this discussion i am considering this so now what is ab ab means a11 a12 up to a1n a21 a22 up to a2n an1 an2 up to ann you are multiplying this with b11 b12 b1n b21 b22 up to b2n and bn1 bn2 bnn so when you are multiplying this the idea is this you have to take the scalar product of the first row and first column that would be your first element that means a11 b11 a12 b21 a1 and bn1 multiply and add the scalar product of the first row and first column would be this one then you have to get the second element scalar product of the first row and second column this is the second element the last element would be on the first row first row times last column take the scalar product of those two, two vectors that will give you the last last element now come to the second row when you are coming to the second row first element this is the scalar product of second row and first column this is the scalar product of second row and second column and this is the scalar product of second row and the last column and in this way you go and when you are reaching nth row then the first element would be nth row and first column the scalar product of this would be this then the next would be nth row times second column and last would be nth row times nth column so this is how we multiply two matrices of square matrices of same dimension of course it has to be of same dimension otherwise scalar product will not be defined okay so now it is saying that if you have a matrix a and i will say that matrix non singular if there exists a matrix which i denote by a inverse why a inverse because in scalar case what i say a times a inverse equal to 1 so in matrix we say a times a inverse or a inverse means one over a in scalar case this is one so similar logic i am using the notation a inverse is a matrix such that if you multiply a inverse by a, a by a inverse or you multiply a inverse by a then you are getting identity matrix what is the identity matrix identity is that matrix is very interesting identity matrix is this matrix identity matrix of order n is it's 100000 to 00001 that is it has n rows n columns and this is the identity matrix what is, why is it called identity matrix this is called identity matrix of order n why it is called identity matrix because if you multiply any matrix with i n you will get the same matrix something like 1 if you multiply a with 1 you will get a okay so identity matrix is this so that means i am saying that a is non singular if you get if you find a matrix a inverse such that a inverse a or, or a a inverse both will give you identity matrix then this matrix is called non singular okay okay and now 
I will tell you another interesting result that also sometimes we need. Rank of A is always equal to rank of A, A transpose and rank of A transpose A. That sometimes we will need. So this is an interesting result. Of course, we are not going to, going to prove it, but this is a standard result. Okay. Now I am coming to orthogonal matrix. What is an orthogonal matrix? Orthogonal matrix means if I multiply A by its transpose or if I multiply A transpose by A, I will get I N. So what does it mean? It, it means in case of orthogonal matrix, A transpose is its inverse. The transpose of the matrix will give you the inverse of the matrix. Okay. And so this is the definition of orthogonal matrix. And what does it mean actually? It means suppose A is A is alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n. Okay. Each is a column vector of n dimensional column vector. Then what is A transpose? What would be A transpose? The first column would be the first row. So it would be alpha 1 transpose is the first row. Alpha 2 transpose is the second row. Alpha 1 transpose is the nth row. So then what is A transpose A? It means alpha 1 transpose, alpha 2 transpose, alpha n transpose times alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n. So now if I multiply this, what is the rule of multiplication? The first row and first column, the scalar product of this should be the first element. So first element would be alpha 1 transpose alpha 1. Second element on the first row would be second column times first row, which is alpha 1 transpose alpha 2. And the last element would be alpha 1 transpose alpha n. In this way, last you will get alpha n transpose alpha 1 to alpha n transpose alpha n. So this is the matrix you are getting. But this is orthogonal means this is i n, identity matrix. So what does it mean? This is equal to 1. The diagonal elements are all 1. And off diagonal elements are all 0. So what does it mean? Off diagonal elements are 0 means if you consider alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n, these vectors are these vectors are orthogonal, orthogonal to each other. And what is the diagonal element? The diagonal element alpha 1 transpose alpha 1. Alpha 2 transpose alpha 2 and alpha n transpose alpha n. These are the diagonal elements and they are equal to 1. They are equal to 1. What does it mean? It means that alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n are orthogonal vectors each is of norm unity. The length of each vector is unity because alpha 1 transpose alpha 1 is what? Alpha 1 transpose alpha 1, you can easily check this is the norm of alpha 1 square. Similarly, alpha n transpose alpha n is the norm of alpha n square. So that means orthogonal matrix means is rows or columns are orthogonal to each other and the vectors length are unity. The length of each vector is unity. So if you have a set of vectors which are orthogonal and their lengths are unity, they often call a set of orthonormal vectors. So for an orthogonal matrix, the rows and columns are orthonormal. Also, 
orthonormal orthogonal vectors are always linearly independent because one cannot be expressed as a linear combination of the other because they are orthogonal perpendicular so that's why basically for an orthogonal matrix its rows or columns actually give you a basis of the column space or row space and that basis is often called orthonormal basis because the basis vectors or columns or rows are orthogonal to each other as well as their lengths are equal to unity so for an orthogonal matrix the rows and columns form an orthonormal basis of the vector space whether it is column space or the row space is it okay yes sir yes sir yes sir. okay so now we need to discuss what is known as determinant of a matrix determinant of a matrix so let's consider 2 by 2 matrix and its determinant a11 a12 a21 a22 and this is determinant of a so the rule is you multiply first the diagonal elements you will get a11 a22 minus then this a12 a21 and this is determinant of a suppose if you have a 3 by 3 matrix to find its determinant what you do first you take a11 and then you find the determinant of this that means a22 a23 a32 a33 then you take next one a12 and then when you taking a, a, when you are considering a12 forget about this column and this row and take the determinant of the rest which is a21 a23 a31 a33 and then again you take plus sign with a13 and then you forget about this row this column and this row so then this multiplied by a21 a22 a31 a32 and this is the way you can calculate determinant of any order okay so determinant is a scalar but what is the interpretation of this it has a very nice interpretation suppose i am considering 2 by 2 situation so, so suppose this is my first column which is a11 a21 this is the vector which represents first column and this is the vector which represents second column which is a12 a22 then what is determinant you complete this parallelogram complete this parallelogram find its area and this area is equal to modulus of determinant of a one can easily check that what does it mean for three dimensional case you have to consider a three dimensional space and these columns are the vectors in a three dimensional space and you consider a three dimensional parallelopipede whose edges are given by these columns and what is the volume of that parallelopipede that volume is equal to the modulus of the determinant of a so similarly in case of n dimensional you can extend this concept so that is the geometrical concept of determinant of a and also this is easy to check that if a is non singular that implies determinant of a equal to not equal to 0 if a is non singular determinant of a should not be zero why it is again from geometrical interpretation it is very easy to understand suppose if you are in three dimension 
and the columns are linearly independent non singular means actually its columns should be linearly independent its rows should be linearly independent okay so a is non singular means suppose a is a n by n matrix rank of a is equal to n that means all its columns are linearly independent all its rows are linearly independent then only it can be non singular so if a is non singular then its columns are independent means suppose in three dimensional space you will get three vectors none of which can be expressed as a linear combination of the others that means these three vectors do not lie in a single plane and then you consider a three dimensional parallelopipede and you will get a volume which is non zero but suppose in three dimensional space what you get two vectors like what we considered two vectors are linearly independent but the third vector lies on the same plane then if you consider the three dimensional parallel pipe the volume of the three dimensional parallel pipe would be zero so that means determinant of a matrix zero means it is singular matrix it is not non singular if a matrix is non singular then determinant of the matrix should be non zero and also you need to understand for a non singular matrix all the rows and all the columns are linearly independent that means if you consider a matrix of order n by n rank of a should be n that means rank of column space would be n rank of row space will also be equal to n okay so this is determinant of a matrix now i will consider an important concept that possibly will be used which is called eigen vector and eigen value of a square matrix Now I consider determinant of a minus lambda times identity matrix equal to zero. What does it mean? It means a one one, a one two, a two one, a two three. Determinant of this minus lambda times identity matrix of order two means one zero zero. Sir, you are on mute. Not in mute. Can you can you hear me? Okay. So now, sir, you are still on mute. No, oh, sir, your voice is feeble, sir. Feeble? I don't know. I am using okay, the iPad. Okay, sir. Now we can hear. Okay. okay. so now determinant of this means if we suppose you multiply by lambda the second one you are getting lambda lambda are the diagonals and of diagonals are zero then you are subtracting then what you are getting a11 minus lambda a12 a21 and a22 minus lambda determinant of this equal to zero and then you find its determinant which is a11 minus lambda times a22 minus lambda this times this you have to multiply minus a12 times a21 equal to 0 and once you multiply this you are getting lambda square minus a11 plus a22 lambda plus A one one A two two minus A one two A two one equal to zero. So this you see is a quadratic equation in lambda. So now if you solve this equation, you will get two roots. Suppose lambda one and lambda two are the two roots of this equation. But these two roots you can see. the decade b also 
it could be real it could be complex roots also because it depends on your uh, discriminant whether it is negative or not okay so this lambda 1 and lambda 2 are called the eigen values of the matrix a so for a 2 by 2 matrix you will get two eigen values which are lambda 1 and lambda 2 note that lambda 1 lambda 2 may be equal also for example if it comes in a perfect square then you have two roots but both both are equal okay so these are called eigen values of a and you can see the eigen values of a may be real may be complex it could be both real and complex depending upon discriminant what it is but now there is a very interesting result which is very interesting in the sense that if a is real symmetric matrix that implies suppose a is a real symmetric matrix of order n by n then it will have naturally n eigen values lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda n are real that means for real symmetric matrix the eigen values are always real you will not get a complex eigen value okay and most of the time you have to work with real symmetric matrix real symmetric matrix means the matrix is symmetric that means rows and columns can be interchangeable and real means the elements of the matrix are all real numbers so for a real symmetric matrix its eigen values are all real that is a very important property okay and then there is another interesting okay so then i have to define eigen vector okay so suppose i consider a as 1 2 2 1 and if i consider determinant of a minus lambda i2 and if i take it equal to zero and if i solve you can easily check you will get lambda 1 equal to 3 And lambda two equal to minus one. You can get it. Okay. So now the question is that what I am doing, I am saying, okay, let's try to solve an equation like this: a x equal to lambda one x, where x is a non-null vector, and a x equal to lambda two x, where x is a non-null vector. so i have two sets of equations one is this the other is this so basically what i am trying first i am finding the eigen values then corresponding to each eigen value i am setting up an equation set of equation which is ax equal to lambda x so the first equation is ax equal to lambda 1x second equation is ax equal to lambda 2x and now i will try to find what values of x x should be non null satisfies this and if you solve this you can easily see i have solved it i found that 1 x for this one the solution of x would be 1 1 and for this one the solution of x would be 1 minus 1 so you can solve these two equations after writing a and lambda 1 equal to 3 and you will find that x equal to 1 1 will satisfy this equation and for this equation 1 minus 1 will satisfy these two equations and this x suppose this x is called the eigen vector corresponding to lambda 1 and this is the eigen vector corresponding to lambda 2 lambda 1 was 3 lambda 2 equal to minus 1 so for each eigen value you can find an eigen vector okay so what does it mean suppose i have a n cross n real symmetric matrix and lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda n suppose i am assuming this 
are the eigenvalues. Then using solving these equations, I can find, suppose P1, P2, Pn are the corresponding eigenvectors. P1 is the eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1, P2 is the eigenvector corresponding to lambda 2, Pn is the eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1. Okay. Now you can see that very interesting here in this particular example. Suppose if 1, 1 is an eigenvector, can I say that 1 over square root of 2, 1 over square root of 2 is an eigenvector also? Yes, if yes. x equal yes, to sir. 1, 1 solve these equations, then instead of 1, 1, if I multiply both sides by 1 over root 2, then also the equation will be solved. Same, same set. So this is also an eigenvalue, eigenvector. From 1, 1, I can get 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. That is, I am multiplying both sides of the equation by 1 over root 2. I am getting this is a solution. Similarly, 1 minus 1, I can say also 1 over root 2 minus 1 over root 2 is also an eigenvector. So why I am doing this? I am doing this because there is a reason. You see, these two eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. This is clear? They are orthogonal. But they are not, their lengths are not unity. So to make their length unity, because what is their length? The length of the first one is 1 square plus 1 square, which is root 2. So I'm dividing this vector by its length. Then I'm getting a vector whose length would be 1. So that's why I am dividing both the orthogonal vectors by its length to get two orthonormal vectors. That is vectors which are orthogonal as well as lengths are unity. And again, these vectors are still the eigenvectors of the matrix A corresponding to lambda 1 and lambda 2. So I am saying this P1, P2, Pn are the eigenvectors which are orthonormal. And one can show actually, you can for a symmetric, real symmetric matrix, it is always possible to get the set of eigenvectors which will form an orthonormal basis of the vector space. Okay. Or they are orthonormal. I can choose it as orthonormal. So lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n are the eigenvalues and p1, p2, pn are the corresponding eigenvectors which are orthonormal. Okay. If I have this, then what is interesting, I am telling you about a decomposition which tells you that in that case, you can write A is equal to lambda 1, P1, P1 transpose, plus lambda 2, P2, P2 transpose, plus lambda N, Pn, Pn transpose. And one can write this as P1, P2, Pn, Diagonal lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n, and P1 transpose, P2 transpose, Pn transpose. One can easily write this in this way. So that means if I say this matrix is P and this matrix is capital lambda, this is cap lambda, and this matrix is the transpose of this, then I can write A as P lambda, P lambda, P transpose. Where P is an orthogonal matrix. Why an orthogonal matrix? Because its columns are orthonormal vectors. Its columns are orthonormal vectors and that's why it is an orthogonal matrix. So what does it tell me? It tells you that if you have a real symmetric matrix of order n, you can write this in this form. 
and which is equivalent to this form and this is what we call the singular value decomposition for a real squares for a square matrix decomposition for a real symmetric matrix that is svd singular value decomposition is svd so singular value decomposition of a real symmetric matrix what is the interpretation or what is the interesting part of this the interesting part of this this is used for you will see that this will be used for dimension reduction how it will be used for dimension reduction so let's give you some hint suppose i have lambda 1 equal to 2 lambda 2 equal to suppose n equal to 100 a 100 dimensional matrix lambda 2 equal to 1 Lambda three equal to zero point zero zero one, lambda four equal to ten to the power minus five, and lambda hundred equal to ten to the power minus ten. Okay, so lambda one two, lambda two one, lambda three point zero zero one, then ten to the power minus five, and so on are much lesser. So can I say in that case A is approximately equal to lambda one p one. P one transpose plus lambda two P two P two transpose. I can ignore the others because the eigenvalues are so small that they are not contributing. So basically, I can say A is approximately equal to this. And if I have this representation, actually, then an n-dimensional vector. dimension can be reduced to two dimension mm -hmm. so in nlp we will see this application that is you will have maybe 50000 cos 50000 matrix n equal to 50000 then using this kind of decomposition you will be able to replace the 50000 dimensional vector to 50 dimension vector because if you go beyond 50 the lambdas become very small and so this will give you for all practical purpose a good approximation to the original matrix and that means instead of 50000 dimension 500000 dimension you can work with a 50 dimensional vectors so that is that is the whole idea about this Uh, spectral decomposition often it is called spectral decomposition or singular value decomposition i think i will stop here uh, for the this is this is uh, the end of my discussion about vectors and matrices and i know that this is very fast okay very fast discussion very fast actually uh, i i don't know because given the time i have to uh, discuss the concepts that you will be required in the subsequent sessions that's why i had to go fast a little fast but of course assuming that you have a little exposure before coming to the class uh, if you have some of you possibly have exposure in matrix algebra then for you Uh, the people who have some exposure they will be easy they will find it much easier to understand those who are first time getting exposed to this kind of algebra they will find it a little difficult but i am sorry for that but i i cannot help because given uh, the time i cannot uh, explain uh, i cannot take more time to explain that's the that's the issue i hope you got at least a part of it even if not all so any question so you see that matrix is you if you always always consider matrix as vector of vectors that is the best thing 
because you consider column vectors and row vectors and you consider column space and row space and rank of a matrix means rank of the column space rank of the row space okay so how many linearly independent vectors column vectors you have or how many linearly independent row vectors you have both are same that is the rank okay and for a non singular matrix all the columns should be linearly independent all the rows should be linearly independent and it should be a square matrix and for our orthogonal matrix the columns would be orthogonal vectors not only orthogonal they are length should be also unity so they are orthonormal vectors similarly rows are orthonormal vectors and for a real symmetric matrix then we consider the concept of eigen values eigen values we defined as determinant of a minus lambda times identity matrix equal to 0 if you solve that you will get for an n by n matrix you will get n eigen values and corresponding to n eigen values if your matrix is real symmetric you can get n eigen vectors which are basically which will give you an orthonormal set of vectors and with that you can get the spectral decomposition and once you get the spectral decomposition if some of the lambda is are significantly large compared to others you can ignore others and you can get an approximation of the matrix using only maybe you have n vectors originally n by n n p1 p2 pn now but now you can approximate a by only two vectors which are p1 and p2 so the other n minus 2 vectors you can just ignore because lambda 3 to lambda n are negligible compared to lambda 1 and lambda 2 such situations arise in nlp and this actually helps you to reduce the n dimensional vector to a two dimensional vector and that you will see often in your discussions in subsequent classes okay so arushi you are you you are uh, you want to say something which sir uh, sir i i was asking you uh, could you please explain cap lambda what sir uh, what is cap lambda you have mentioned uh, cap lambda is the matrix cap is diagonal lambda matrix lambda there p cap lambda p transpose cap lambda is this diagonal yes, matrix sir. this matrix i am representing by cap lambda the diagonal matrix that is it has diagonal yes, elements sir. lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda n which are the eigen values of the matrix a and off diagonal elements are zero this is a diagonal matrix and that diagonal matrix we denote it by cap lambda small lambda is this cap yes, lambda sir. is this thank you sir huh? because it is a matrix that that's why we use cap lambda Is it fine? Thank you, sir. Okay, yes, sir. so let's take a ten minutes break, and then I will start the essentials of or basic probability. What you will need. Um, so I just have a small doubt. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you said that uh, unit length, right? Uh, for the orthogonal matrix, uh, sir. Does that mean it's a dot? The dot means what are you saying? Sir, so unit length uh, uh, of so each column vector. So you see uh, that for an orthogonal matrix, the column vectors are orthogonal; they are perpendicular to each other. Ha. Uh, Now. the length of the vectors also should be one okay hmm. so that is what i am saying a set of orthonormal then i am saying orthonormal vectors okay okay hmm. okay yes sir hmm. each column vector will have length unity each row vector should have length unity okay although they are always already orthogonal hmm. Okay, so and the column uh, vector space and the row space uh, is that a vector or a set of vectors? Like I understood what the column space is. What you have n columns? 
Yes, ha, yes. yes. Then you take all possible linear combinations of the columns. Ha, okay. And you can generate infinite number of vectors. Okay. And that okay. is the column space. It's okay. a vector space. Mm -hmm. Similarly, okay. row space is what? You have n row vectors. Uh, and take all possible linear combinations of these row vectors and that will give you the row space. It is again a vector space. You have infinite number of vectors in that space. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, sir, I have a question. Any other question? Uh, sir, I have a doubt, sir. Yes, yes. Tell me, tell me. Uh, sir, uh, if uh, let's consider a matrix, like uh, let's say it's symmetric, sir. So uh, yes. when we are taking like all the eigen vectors, when we're considering it from different eigen space, like uh, let's say like uh, let's take some eigen vectors from different eigen space, sir. So will they be orthogonal or? No, I am not getting it. You see that you need to understand one thing that for yes. a real symmetric matrix, the eigen values are unique. That okay, is sir. determinant of. A minus lambda I equal to zero, that is an nth degree polynomial that you will get. And for nth degree polynomial equation, you will have n roots. And those roots are fixed. Eigenvalues you cannot change. But the eigenvectors are not unique because you see AX equal to lambda X, that's what I'm solving. Suppose AX is an eigenvector. Then if I multiply AX by some constant C, that will also satisfy the equation. So eigenvectors are not unique. That's what I used actually. I first found eigenvectors. Those are orthogonal, but I found that their lengths are not unity. So what I did, I multiplied the vectors by one over their length. So that the vectors become orthonormal. That means orthogonal as well as their lengths become unity. Okay, sir. So, like, my doubt is not this one, sir. Uh, you, uh, did, did I answer your question? Sir, a bit, sir. Like, I still have doubt. In, uh, uh, what, what is the doubt exactly? Tell me. Uh, sir, uh, considering some eigenvectors from different, like, uh, for some uh, lambda i and lambda j, we have corresponding eigenvectors, say, uh, P -I -P -J. V and W. PIPJ so, would be the corresponding. Okay, so VI and VJ. So uh, these two vectors will be orthogonal or not? Sir? Yes, should be yeah. orthogonal. For real symmetric matrix, you can always choose your uh, eigenvectors, which are always orthogonal. You can choose that. Okay, so thank you. And that is why real symmetric matrix is important. If the matrix is real symmetric, all these properties will hold. For example, if the matrix is not real symmetric, even the eigenvalues can be complex. Sure. Thank you. So for a real symmetric matrix, the eigenvalues are real, as well as you can choose your eigenvectors which are orthogonal to each other. And then multiplying by one over its length, you can make it an orthonormal set of vectors. Sir, I have a doubt. Uh, in, SV, in SVD, in the formula, is it important for P to be orthonormal or is it sufficient that it is orthogonal? So basically what SVD is saying, this, this decomposition is called singular value decomposition for a square real symmetric matrix. So it is telling you that these columns are orthogonal. These rows are, ortho, those are orthonormal. These rows are orthonormal. And these are called the singular values. These are called singular values. These lambda i's are called singular values, which are the eigen values. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, so let's take a break for 10 minutes. We'll come back. Is it fine? I don't think. Yes. You are already bored. <laughs> Tell me when you get bored. 
No, no, sir. It was really excellent session. Please, you really enjoy a lot, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. We'll complete by five minutes. Five or ten minutes. Sorry, ten. Minutes.
हेलो 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 सर हाँ सो कैन यू स्टार्ट यस सर ओके यस सर आई वाज जस्ट वेटिंग ओके सो आई विल गिव यू अ क्विक टूर ऑफ द बेसिक प्रोबेबिलिटी दैट विल पॉसिबली रिक्वायर so basically what you need to understand first that is very important is conditional probability <clears throat> so let's try to understand conditional probability suppose i am considering a spam i am trying to develop a spam filter hmm? and uh, suppose a word which is kind of uh, africa african general hmm. so this is a word and the other is other words that is not african other hmm. and if you consider say total uh, 2000 males you consider and suppose out of that you have uh, 1500 are spam and 500 are non spam okay and suppose in out of 1500 you will see that suppose in 1400 males mm, so african general i will say appeared and not appeared maybe that is a better way to say this word not appeared out of 1500 spam mail in 1400 spam mail you found that african general this this particular word appeared and in 100 mails it didn't appear and out of 500 non spam mail you will see possibly in 5 uh, mails this appeared and in 495 mails it didn't appear okay so uh, now the question is suppose i am asking you uh, this question what is the probability that this word african general will appear in a men okay what is the probability that is african general appeared suppose this is this this probability i have to find and probability that african general not appeared what is the probability of that okay and of course you have to also find what is the probability of spam mail what is the probability of non spam mail so this probability suppose i have to find can you tell me from this how to find probability that are in a mail probability that african general this particular term will appear number of observations upon number of total observations so probability so what would be what would be the number can you say One. from this table 1405 by 2000 divided by 1500 No, fourteen hundred and five divided by two thousand. Two thousand. Two thousand, because all males you need to consider, na? Similarly, not. Sir, shouldn't it be fourteen hundred and five? Fourteen hundred and yes, you are right. African general is fourteen hundred five, and not appeared is five hundred ninety-five. You are right. Four fourteen hundred five divided by two thousand, and not appeared would be. 595 95 divided by 2000 and probability of spam would be 1500 by 
1500 divided by 2000 and not spam would be 500 divided by 2000. So these probabilities are often called unconditional probability. Now I am asking this question. Probability that African general, this term will appear given that it's a spam name. What is the probability? 1400 by 1500. Exactly, 1400 over 1500. Similarly, probability African general will not appear, suppose I am using bar, given the spam is 100 by 1500. Okay. So now, if you think about a spam filter, what would I would be interested? Basically, I will pick up certain words which actually occur in spam mails. African general is one such word. So now, I would be interested when I get a mail, I don't know whether it is spam or not, I would be interested to find whether the mail, what is the probability that this mail is spam given that the African general, this word has appeared. This is what I would be interested in. Because this is kind of training data. I can say it's a training data. Okay. This is the training data that I am training. I am, I am using, I am using this data to build a model so that I can detect a spam. And how can I detect a spam? Given that African general appeared in a particular mail, what is the probability that it will be spam? If this probability is very high, that means African general is a word that will be able to classify spam from non-spam very well. It's a classification problem. You got a mail, you need to classify it in either spam or non-spam. You are looking at the words, African general. If it is there, what is the probability that it will be spam? Can you tell me from the table what would be this probability? 1400 by 14, not 5. 1400 divided by? 1405. Yes, you are right. 1400 divided by 1405. Because you are given that African general appeared. So in how many males African, African general appeared? 1405. Out of which, in how many case it was a spam? So 1400 divided by 1405. So this is the probability, conditional probability, that given African general has appeared, what is the probability that the male is spam? And from this table, you can easily calculate. But when actually uh, you need to calculate it using these probabilities. So the question is, can I calculate this probability using these probabilities? That is the question I will try to answer, answer by using a very, very important theorem in the theory of probability, which has a far reaching implication which is called Bayes' theorem. Okay, so suppose African general appeared. So now I have to find, so I have to find probability of spam given that African general appeared. So you see that I can write that Bayes' theorem say, you can calculate this, African general given spam times probability that probability of a spam divided by probability of African general given spam times probability of spam plus probability of African general Yes, African general, probability of spam. Then probability of African general 
not appeared given spam then plus probability of african general it is a non spam times probability it is a non spam so you see that what was the probability of african general given spam what was that probability what was this probability 1400 by 1405 how much 1400 by 1405 1405 probability of spam 1500 divided by 2000 that was there similarly the first term would be same as that plus african general appeared in non spam what was that probability given that it was non spam 10 over 500 something like that out of 500 non spam mails in 10 it appeared okay in the table if you think about and probability of non spam is 500 over 2000 okay i am so i am using this probability to calculate this probability i know given a spam what is the probability of african african general will appear i know what is the probability of spam i know if it is not a spam mail then what is the probability that african general will appear and i know what is the probability of getting a non spam mail and then from this i can calculate also the same thing and you can check that this would be equal to the probability that we have given in the previous page you can easily check that so what does it tell you that this this is often called bayes theorem bayes theorem so it tells you something like that that i know that suppose uh, i know that uh, there are k causes are there and a is the event it is an outcome okay so i am given given this probabilities probability of a1 a2 ak as well as probability of a given a1 to probability of a given ak i need to find probability of ak say a1 given a so this to find this you have to apply bayes theorem so what what in this case in the previous case what i had my causes is either it is a spam mail or it is not a spam mail and outcome is whether the african general appeared or not so african general appeared given that it is spam african general appeared given that it is not non spam then i am now asking given that african general has appeared what is the probability that it is a spam so this kind of questions can be answered only by bayes theorem i am giving you another very interesting example which is an application of this suppose suppose that uh, covid 19 testing think about this in covid 19 testing uh, test could be positive or test could be negative and test positive doesn't mean that person has covid 
it doesn't mean that the person has the disease because there could be false positive and false negative the chance is there so now what you can find from lab experiments from lab experiments you can generate data how can you generate data you can find okay if someone has covid then what is the probability that the test will give a positive result if someone has doesn't have covid that is normal person then what is the probability that he will he or she will be positive in the test result so this you can find from lab experiment but when actually you are applying your test in real life what you are interested you are interested in to detect whether the person has a covid if the test result is positive so what does it mean this is the this is the outcome uh, this is the cause and the test result is your outcome so you are given from the lab experiment you can generate given the cause what is the probability of outcome and then you are trying to find what is the probability of cause given the outcome and this if you apply bayes theorem what will be this can you tell me positive result given covid times probability that someone will have covid probability of cause positive result given covid times probability of covid plus probability of positive result given someone doesn't have covid times probability that not having covid so this is bayes theorem because this you can easily get because you know the prevalence rate of covid okay so in the particular population you know say 10% have already infected or incidence the prevalence rate is 10% 10% are infected then from the lab you know if someone has covid what is the chance that he will get positive outcome and using this you can see that probability of covid given that someone is positive this probability is often called the predictive probability for covid that is from the test result you are trying to predict whether the person has covid or not and for that again you have to use bayes theorem so bayes theorem basically tells you that if you have several causes and there is an outcome then given the probability of different causes and the probability of outcome given different causes how can you find the probability of of the of a cause given the outcome? for example here the outcome is test result cause is the person is diseased or not and given that the outcome is positive what is the chance that the probability what is the chance that the person has is diseased that is what bayes theorem can answer so this probability often cannot be calculated directly okay so basically this gives you first of all i i discussed two things one is i tried to give you an idea about conditional probability so conditional probability means the probability of an event given that another event has occurred so this has occurred if you know this has occurred what is the probability of this event to occur this is conditional probability and you calculate it from the data and what i next discussed bayes theorem which is that a1 a2 ak are the causes causes and a is the outcome given the probability of different causes and given the probability of the outcome for from different causes if i have to find out e1 given a that is what is the probability that this person 
uh, this person outcome is I know what is the probability that cause was it. For example, it could be that a person can die because of K disease and outcome is death. So now I know what is the probability of different disease. A person has a particular disease, what is the probability I know? Also, I know given that someone has cancer, what is the probability of death? Given that someone is tuberculosis, what is the probability of death? Now, the question I am answering, given that someone died, what is the probability that he died because of cancer? So this is the kind of question which is answered by Bayes' theorem. So in this case, probability A1 given A would be probability A given A1 times probability of A1 divided by probability of A given A1 times probability of A1 up to probability of A given AK, probability of AK. So this is Bayes' theorem. Okay. So this is, this is known as Bayes' theorem. And this is used in uh, sp filtering spams. Bayes' theorem is used. Basically, in different classification problem, you can use this. I will come to a classification problem where we'll use this. Okay. So, is this fine? Any, any question on this? Any question? So, I defined conditional probability. I defined unconditional probability. And I also gave you the idea about Bayes' theorem. So the idea about Bayes' theorem is if you know the probability of causes and the probability of outcome given different causes, then Bayes' theorem will give you the probability of the cause given the outcome. For example, if I have to find probability that someone died because of cause A2, then what would be the change in this formula? Ah. A1 will be replaced by A2. Exactly. A1 will be replaced by A2 and the denominator will remain same. Okay. So this is Bayes' theorem. Now I come to a very, very important distribution. often called Gaussian distribution. Have you heard about it? Or often called normal distribution? What is this? Suppose I'm considering height distributions of Indian. So if I plot the side distribution of Indians, I will get here I am plotting kind of frequency kind of thing. That is how many will have what heights. I will get a picture like this. Well, this is the average height. And average height for Indians say five feet, six inches. So 66 inches and this gives you the spread for example if you think about this i will say that this spread is this is sigma the standard deviation so this is average plus standard deviation okay and you see that the spread is not average plus standard deviation it can go up to average plus average plus two standard deviation, average minus two standard deviation and something like this. And suppose the standard deviation, I'm assuming that it is mm, four inches. Okay, so four inches is giving the spread of the, so you see that the most of the people have values in the average, near average. And if you go on the, this direction that is less than average, your 
frequency is decreasing and as well as when you are going in this direction your frequency is decreasing that means most of the people will have an average height very few people few people will be tall and very few people will be very short so from this what i can say that on, I, I i will say that probability that the height height of a person would be average plus standard deviation to average minus standard deviation usually for normal distribution it is 68% probability that average minus two standard deviation to height would be average plus two standard deviation that would be around 95% of the for the for 95% of the people height would be between this and probability that average minus 3 standard deviation height would be between average minus 3 standard deviation to average plus 3 standard deviation it is 99.73% so if a distribution have this kind of property and this is the shape of the distribution and this shape is called bell shaped and symmetric you can see it is symmetric because if you consider this particular line and if you wrap it one will superimpose on the other so this is how we define a normal distribution or gaussian distribution and this is the average middle point is the mean and this spread is giving you the standard deviation standard deviation is the spread it's a measure of spread okay is this fine yes so, sir let me draw it now properly so what i am saying that suppose this is x in our case x was height and the distribution of x if it looks like this where average is here and we denote it by mu and this we denote standard deviation sigma then the normal distribution is something like this such that probability that x will be between mu plus sigma to mu minus sigma that would be 68% probability x would be mu plus 2 sigma and mu minus 2 sigma that would be 95% probability x will lie between mu plus 3 sigma to mu minus 3 sigma that will be 99.73% so this is how we describe a normal distribution okay and this function this function which is bell shaped and symmetric usually we denote by fx and the functional form is often is given by 1 over sigma over square root 2 pi e to the power minus 1 over 2 sigma square x minus mu whole square and x varies between plus infinity to minus infinity so what does it mean it means that the curve will go to zero as it is going to minus infinity and the curve will go to zero again as it is going to plus infinity basically it means that the area under the curve between plus infinity to minus infinity would be equal to 1 total probability that's the total probability because everyone should be under this limit so that means the probability that you will get everyone between minus infinity to plus infinity is 1 that is the certain you will get so that's why the area under the curve between minus infinity to plus infinity should be one suppose if you have to find if you have to find okay let me find this i have a normal distribution whose mean is mu whose mean is mu and variance is sigma i have to find what is the probability and this is ax what is the probability that x lies between a to b so then what i need to do suppose this is b and this is a i have to draw two vertical lines and find the area under a and b this area will give you the probability that x lies between a and b 
because the total area is one, this area should be whatever, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.4, whatever. It depends on mu and sigma, of course. Okay? Is this clear? This is called Gaussian distribution or normal distribution, whose mean is mu and standard deviation is sigma. Okay. Now, now I am going straight to classification problem. Ooh. Let's go to classification problem. In classification problem, what is done, and I am considering only for the simplicity, I am considering binary classification problem. So binary classification problem means I have two class. Yeah. So I am denoting this by y equal to 0 and 1. These are two classes. OK, so either a person belongs to class 0 or the person belongs to class one. Two classes maybe I am looking, I am trying to predict whether the person would be defaulter if I give a loan or he will not be a defaulter. So defaulter may be one and non-defaulter would be zero. So there are two classes of customers when a bank is giving loans that the customer may default or may not default. So this is called binary classification, you can have a multinomial classification problem. That means you have more than two classes, but the theory can be extended similar way. And now when I have to classify someone into one of these two classes, so what I look at, I look at it features, feature vector basically. Feature vector is denoted by X. For example, the person's income, the person's age, the person's uh, previous credit card history and all these things, civil score. So this is the feature vector X. And what I would like to do, I would like to predict Y using X. So what I try to find, I would try to find probability Y equal to one given X. It's a conditional probability that I would like to find. If I find for certain feature AX, this probability is very high, that means the chance that the person will be a defaulter, I will not give the loan. And if for certain feature, this probability is very low, then for those people, the chance of being a defaulter is very low. Okay, so basically the problem in classification, uh, binary classification problem is given a feature ve vector AX, you have to uh, decide whether the person will belong to class zero or class one. If you know this probability, then naturally you know that probability y equal to zero given x equal to one minus probability y equal to give one given x. So if you find probability y equal to one given x, automatically you will get probability y equal to zero given x. Okay? So now the question is, how can you find this? How can you find this? So usually uh, there are two kinds of learning algorithm that is used in machine learning. One is called uh, discriminative learning algorithm. You have a trading data set, okay? Training data. Training data means from the bank's historical data, you can find, suppose uh, Y1, X1, Y2, X2, up to Yn, Xn. So N may be, say, 1 million, it could be. So, you know, this is for the first person. His feature is this. And whether he defaulted or not, you know, either zero or one. So these values you know from the historical data of the bank. Okay, so now you need to find for a future customer, what is the probability given his feature is X or her feature is X, 
what is the probability that probability y equal to one given x? You, are, you need to find that. This is your data, training data. So what would you do in discriminative learning, learning algorithm, what they do, they say, okay, this probability, since it is a probability, it should lie between zero and one. So suppose I find a function of x, which is hx, such that it lies between zero and one. Okay, so what kind of function I can choose? The function I am choosing is e raised to the power beta naught, or I will say beta transpose x divided by one plus e raised to the power beta transpose x. What is beta transpose x? Beta transpose x is beta naught plus beta one x one plus beta p x p. Suppose you have in your feature vector x, your feature vector is one x1, one, x2, xp, and beta vector is beta naught, beta one to beta p. Then in matrix notation, you can write beta vector notation, beta transpose x is the scalar product of this. And this is nothing but e to the power beta transpose x divided by one plus e to the power beta transpose x. If I use this function for hx, then we say we are using logistic regression. Okay. So discriminative learning algorithm in which we use actually logistic regression, we model this probability using the feature vector x as a function of the feature vector x. And this is the logistic function. And logistic function actually looks like this. It is, e raised to the power theta one plus e raised to the power theta. And if you draw theta, and here this is say h theta, the logistic function, then you will see that at zero, it is 0.5. When theta equal to zero, it is 0.5. So the function looks like this. And as theta tends to infinity, it asymptotically goes to one. And when theta tends to minus infinity, it asymptotically goes to zero. So it is often called a sigmoid function. So we are using sigmoid function to model this probability. And in this case, we have, instead of theta, we are using beta transpose x, which is a linear function of the feature vector. e raised to the power beta transpose x plus one plus, divided by one plus e raised to the power beta transpose x. And this gives you the logistic regression. Now the question is, given your training data set, you need to estimate beta from your training data set. And then once you get an estimate from your training data set, so estimate beta from training data. And suppose the estimate is beta hat. Estimate is beta hat. Then your estimated probability of y equal to one given feature vector x is e raised to the power beta hat transpose x divided by one plus e beta hat transpose x. So that means now if you get a new customer whose feature vector is x, you can predict the probability of he of her being defaulted, probability y equal to one given x. Because from your training data, you calculated an estimate, you found an estimate of beta and using that, you have found your model from the training data, and then you are now applying for a future customer, this model to classify the person into defaulter or non-defaulter class, two classes. So now the question is, given this training data set, how can I, how can I estimate beta? What method I should use to estimate beta? 
So for that, let me discuss something which is called maximum likelihood method of estimation. Maximum likelihood method of estimation. So let's take a simple case. Suppose my feature vector x is just uh, one and x. That means only one feature I am using. So my model uh, probability y equal to one given x is basically e raised to the power beta naught plus beta one x divided by one plus e raised to the power beta naught plus beta one x. And we know this function always lies between zero to one. So the suppose I have training data, training data, and in training data I have, suppose the first person is a defaulter and his x is uh, uh, say x1, and the second person is a non-defaulter, his x is x2, and third person is a defaulter, his x is x3, fourth person is a non-defaulter, his x is x4, Fifth person is a non-defaulter, his feature, vector, feature is x5. And suppose I have five, in my training data, I have five observation. Usually this is very large. So now what maximum likelihood method of estimation says, okay, what is the probability of y equal to one given x1? times what is the probability that y equal to zero given x2 times what is the probability that y equal to one given x3 times probability what is the probability of y equal to zero given x4 times what is the probability that y equal to zero given x5 what does it represent it represents the probability of observing the sample. Basically, what you have observed in your training data, what is the probability that if someone's feature is x1, then he or she is a defaulter? What is the probability if someone's feature is x2, he or she will be a non-defaulter? So basically, what you observed, it is the probability of your sample that you observe. And if you think about this probability, what is this? First probability would be e raised to the power beta naught plus beta one x one divided by one plus e raised to the power beta naught plus beta one x one. Can you tell me what would be the second probability? Probability y equal to zero given x two. E power B naught plus B2 X2 by 1 plus E power. If this is probability Y equal to 1, what is probability Y equal to 0 given X? 1 minus this. Uh -huh. And actually you can find that this is 1 over 1 plus 1 e, over e uh, beta naught plus minus. beta 1 X. So the second would be 1 over one plus e raised to the power beta naught plus beta one x2. And in this way, the last one would be zero, okay? One over one plus e raised to the power beta naught plus beta one x5. So this gives you what is called the likelihood function. often denoted by L. And this L is a, you see this likelihood function, L is a function of the parameters beta naught and beta one. Because X1, X2, these are, you, you have already observed the features. You know, in your data you have. Only beta naught, beta one are unknown. And why it is called a likelihood function? Because this gives you the likelihood of observing the sample that you have observed. And since actually it is using some kind of conditional probability, it is often called the conditional likelihood also. 
So now the question is, what would you try to get an estimate of beta naught and beta one? What you will try? What would be the best estimate of beta naught and beta one? What your intuition says? I will try to find beta naught and beta one that maximizes this likelihood. Because that is the most likely value of beta naught and beta one based on my data. So what you need to do, you need to maximize this likelihood with respect to beta naught and beta one. And for that usually they use gradient descent method or any kind of optimization method and find the value of beta naught, beta one, beta naught and beta one that maximizes these and that is a beta naught hat and beta one hat. And once you get this, you know the estimated probability of y equal to one given x, which is estimated probability would be beta naught hat plus beta one hat x, beta naught hat plus beta one hat x. Now suppose a future customer comes whose future is X, then you can find the probability for that future customer. And if the probability is more than 0.5, that means there is a higher chance of her being defaulted. And if it is less than 0.5, that means there's a lower chance of being, it, being a defaulter. So if it is greater than 0.5, you will classify her in class one and if this probability you find less than 0.5, you will classify her in class zero. That's how this logistic regression works in classifying observations, future observations. Now, instead of this, sometimes what is used is called uh, generative learning algorithm for classification. What is this? You see that in logistics, what you did, you tried to suppose given X, you tried to estimate the probability that a person with feature X, what is the chance that she will be in class one or she will be in class zero? Whichever probability is higher, I will classify her into that. That's the idea. And to find, to estimate that probability, we have used logistic regression and to estimate the parameters of the logistic regression betas, we use maximum likelihood method of estimation. From the training data set, we get an estimate of the betas. And once you have the estimate of betas for future, customers whose X you know, you just plug in that value of X to that model and get the estimated probability of her being defaulter or non-defaulter. If the probability is more than 0.5, then put it put her in one class. If it is less than 0.5, put her in another class. That's what the logistic regression does. Now this Generative learning algorithm, they use a different kind of approach. And what kind of approach they use? They use something like this. Okay, I have training data. And I know these N1 people are defaulted. And these N2 people are non-defaulted. I know from my training data. And I am interested in feature X, okay? So I am assuming for the defaulter, the feature X has a, suppose this feature X is P cross one vector, has a multivariate normal distribution with min mu one, variance covariance matrix sigma, and this has a multivariate normal distribution with min mu naught and variance covariance matrix sigma. So let's try to understand this. 
consider single x is a single variable. So suppose I have my feature vector is only x. So what it is saying that for non-default term, the mean is mu naught. And for default term, suppose you find that the distribution has mean mu one. And of course, both has same sigma. Because sigma I have assumed to be same, but only I am assuming their means are different. So now, if this is the situation, this is the situation, then what I will do, I will find the estimate of mu naught sigma b1 from my training data. Once I get the estimate, then what I will do, I will try to find what is the probability of y given one, given the feature vector is x. Now, how can I find that? Okay, so you see that here, what we are assuming, we are assuming probability of y equal to one is equal to say, theta. And naturally, probability of y equal to zero is one minus theta. And then what I am saying, I know, I know that the distribution of x when y equal to one, that is normal with mean mu one vector and variance covariance matrix sigma. I know the distribution of feature vector when y equal to zero. That is normal with mean vector mu naught and variance covariance matrix sigma. So I know these probabilities. These are called often called prior probabilities, prior. Because if you give me a sample, I can say, okay, what is the chance that a person will be defaulted? It may be, it, it, depend, it depends from, it varies from sample to sample. Suppose if you consider an Indian bank's data, the defaulter could be very high this probability could be very high. But if you consider a data for Hong Kong, this theta would be very small. So the prior probability is basically the probability that if you pick up a person at random, one customer at random, what is the chance that the person would be defaulted? On the other hand, given that he or she is defaulted, what is the distribution of her feature vector? So this is the distribution of our feature vector. This is the mean and the standard deviation I am assumed to be. Both for both I am assumed same. And the mean for the feature, for the non-defaulter, the mean would be somewhere here. So for example, this AX, suppose if you consider a single feature vector, it is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, maybe something which is low when someone is a non-defaulter and it is high when someone is a defaulter. What could be a feature variable like that? It could be. So I will say that uh, date, date is X. If someone's date is high, then possibly the chance is uh, that this guy will be defaulter. And if someone's date is small, then the chance of defaulter is small. So the mean of this mu one is greater than mu naught. So something like that. So I'm assuming that the feature vectors have two different distributions, two different normal distributions. And these normal distributions have same variance covariance matrix sigma, but different mean vector mu one and mu naught. Okay. But still now I have not discussed this distribution. This is often called multivariate normal distribution. I have discussed univariate normal distribution. That is when you have a single variable, its distribution is normal, how does it look like? But when it is a multivariate distribution, how does it look like? Let me give you a picture. So in case of multivariate distribution, I am drawing a bivariate distribution, kind of this. 
So I am not a, you, you see that I, I cannot draw it well. So basically what I am saying that it is giving you a kind of dome, okay? It's in a two dimensional space. This is X1 and this is X2. And its center is at mean of X1 and mean of X2, which is mu1, mu2. Okay. And now it has a variance. Okay. For example, for this in this direction, in this direction, so the variance is coming from this. Okay. This. And in this direction, the variance is coming from this. So I have assumed that variances are suppose in this in x1 direction variance is sigma 1 square in x2 direction variance is sigma 2 square now the third thing which is coming which is actually coming from correlation between x1 and x2 and suppose x1 and x2 the two feature vectors that you are considering are correlated and their correlation is rho then a matrix I can form where the diagonal, I will say this is, this is x1, this is x2, this is x1, this is x2, this is variance of x1, this is, I will say, covariance x1, x2, this is variance of x2, this is covariance x1, x2. So this is sigma for two dimension and variance, so this matrix becomes Covariance x1, x2 is correlation coefficient rho times standard deviation of x1 then standard deviation of x2. So this matrix sigma becomes sigma 1 square, rho sigma 1, sigma 2, rho sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 2 square. So this is the variance covariance matrix. That means the diagonal terms are giving you the variance and off diagonal terms are giving you an idea about the correlation. For example, if these off-diagonal terms are near zero, that means x1 and x2 are uncorrelated. On the other hand, if this is positive high value, that means possibly they are positively correlated. So this is called often variance covariance matrix. So for a bivariate normal distribution or multivariate normal distribution, you need to have this variance covariance matrix. That means you need to know the variances of all the variables as well as the covariances between any pair of variables that will give you sigma and the mean mu1 is the mean of x1 this is mean of x1 and mu2 is equal to mean of x2 so basically for multivariate normal distribution you will have a again symmetric form a dome which is kind of symmetric but it has mean as well as variance as well as covariance because you see that suppose i am assuming that this is the base of the dome base of the dome is this x1 and x2 in this case if the base of the dome is this what would you say about the correlation of x1 x2 what did you say x1 x2 about correlation of x1 and x2 are they correlated? Are they correlated? What did you say? What did you say? Suppose I am giving you another picture. The base of the dome is something like this. This is x1, this is x2. What did you say about the correlation between x1 and x2? Suppose the base of the dome is something like this. What is the correlation between x1 and x2? Any idea? If x1, x2 values are like this, then what is the correlation between x1 and x2? Positive. 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 And here it is? Negative. 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 So here rho would be positive. Here rho would be negative. And here? Zero. zero. Approximately zero. 
So that means in case of when you are considering a multivariate distribution, depending upon the base, x1 and x2 may be correlated, may not be correlated. So the sigma matrix, it captures variance, covariance, which is the correlation, as well as you have a mean vector. That means what I can say that is this is something like this. This is something like this, I will say. This is something like this. I will say, suppose I have x1, x2, xn, xp. This is a multivariate normal distribution with mean mu and variance covariance matrix sigma. It means mu is a vector which is mu1, mu2 to mu p. And mu1 is mean of x1, mu2 is mean of x2 and mu p is mean of x p. And what is this variance covariance matrix? This is x1, x2, x p, x1, x2, x p, and this is variance of x1. This is covariance of x1, x2. This is covariance of x1, x p. And this is covariance of x2, x1. And this is variance of x2. And this is covariance of x2, xp. And this is covariance of xp, x1. Covariance of xp, x2. And covariance variance of xp. So this matrix is sigma. And covariance of any two variable, covariance of xi, xj, is nothing but correlation into sigma i times sigma j. Actually, I say rho ij. Correlation between xi, xj is rho ij. So now, can you, can, you, can you see one very interesting thing? This sigma matrix is symmetric, can I say? Because the first row and first column are the same. So it's a symmetric real matrix. So this singular value decomposition is applicable for this matrix. And actually that is used for finding principal components. Actually you do a singular value decomposition of sigma. You will see that. Okay, so this is the idea about the multivariate normal distribution. So now you see what now I, I am going back to the classification problem. I have to find what I have to find. I know, I know probability of the feature vector given y equal to 1. I know the probability of the feature vector given y equal to 0. I know probability y equal to 1 and probability y equal to 0. This is, I say, theta and this is 1 minus theta. Now this probability distribution I know NP, mu1, sigma, and this is NP, mu0, sigma. That I know. Now I need to find probability y equal to 1 given x. This is what I need to find. What I will do? I will again apply Bayes' theorem. Basically, I will apply again Bayes theorem. Because given that someone is defaulter, someone is defaulter, I know his or her feature distribution. Given that someone is non-defaulter, given that someone is defaulter, I know the distribution of our features. Okay. So these probabilities I know. From the training data, I can estimate this. From the training data, I will get an estimate of mu naught, mu one, sigma, and theta. Estimate from training data. 
And for estimating this, again, I will use maximum likelihood method of estimation. Maximum likelihood method of estimation. And how can I write the likelihood here? I am again showing you the likelihood I can write something like this. Because suppose I have data x1 feature y1, the corresponding outcome, x2, y2 up to xn, yn. This is my training data. Now I have to write the likelihood of likelihood based on this data. So I will write probability of x1 given y1 times probability of y1 multiplied by probability x2 given y2 multiplied by probability of y2 and so on up to probability of xn given yn times probability of yn. And you see that y1, y2, yn, you know, these are either 0 or 1 because in your training data, you know y1, y2, yn. Suppose if y1, if y1 equal to 1, p y1, you will take as theta. And if y1 equal to 0, you will put p y1 equal to 1 minus theta. And similarly, if y1 is equal to 1, y1 equal to 1, then probability x1 given y1 would be the density function that is density function of np b1 sigma. I have given you the density function of, I have given you the density function of normal distribution, which is 1 over sigma root 2 pi e to the power minus 1 over 2 sigma square x minus mu whole square. But what is the density function of multivariate normal with mean mu variance sigma? This will be something like this. 2 pi p over 2 determinant of sigma raised to the power half minus half x minus mu transpose sigma inverse x minus mu. I am just giving you because if, even if you don't understand, it's fine. Basically, it is giving you the dome, the height of the dome as a function of x. Okay, so this gives you the height of the dome, this function. This is the multivariate normal distribution density function. So if you plug in this density function with the corresponding values of x1, x2, xn, so you know that if x given y equal to 1 is 1 over 2 pi p over 2 determinant of sigma raised to the power half e to the power minus half x minus since y equal to 1, it would be mu1, mu1 transpose sigma inverse x minus mu1. So you just, you know x, you know y, you just put it there in the likelihood. Likelihood becomes a function of sigma, mu1, mu0, and theta. And then maximize it. Maximize it. And get light, likelihood estimate sigma hat, mu1 hat, mu0 hat and theta hat, and then find probability y equal to one given x for a future customer using Bayes' theorem. I have given you the expression. So that's how the generative learning algorithm works. That is, in logistic regression, you try to predict y given x by using a logistic regression, which is basically directly giving you the probability y equal to one given x. And for that, for, for approximating that function, you use logistic regression. But in generative learning algorithm, what you are doing, you are looking from the other way around. You are saying, okay, who are defaulter? Who are non-defaulter? And let's look at them. For example, if you see that for the defaulter, your x1, x2 are all here. And for the non-defaulter, your x1, x2 are all here. 
then this line actually this this probability y equal to one given x will give you a line. So if everyone is on this side of the line, you will say they are non-default. And this is x2. So it is saying that if you were a non-defaulter, your feature distribution, if you are a defaulter, your feature distribution will be distinct. And then try to use that to predict who is whose value of y equal to 1 and whose value of y equal to 0. You try to predict that using that feature distribution. But in you see that in case of logistic, we are not using this feature distribution. We are directly using what is the probability y equal to 1 given x, which is e to the power beta transpose x, 1 over e to the power beta transpose x. And now use, and now try to estimate beta using your training data. But here what you are doing first, you are looking at the feature distributions of two types of people, two types of defaulters and non-defaulters. And based on that, you are trying to identify uh, if someone, say new case comes, if his or her x is near this cluster, or his or her case, uh, x is near this cluster, if, the, if he or she is here, then possibly he is in this class, or she is in this class. If he or she is here, possibly he or she is in this class. So that's how it actually works. Okay, so actually you see that in probability, what I tried to cover, of course, very sketchily, one is unconditional probability, conditional probability, and of course, here I also considered conditional probability. Logistic regression is nothing but a conditional probability of y, which is a discrete binary variable, one and zero, given x, x is a feature which is usually continuous, and in case of generative learning algorithm, we considered a multivariate normal distribution. And again, we used some kind of conditional probability argument, which is how to find probability of y equal to 1 given the feature x using Bayes' theorem. Because I know given that someone is coming from class 1, I know the feature distribution of R. And someone if is coming from class zero, I know the feature distribution of R using multivariate normal. Now the inverse problem I have to solve, that is given the feature is X, what is the chance that she is coming from the defaulter distribution, that is she is close to this cluster or whether she is close to this cluster. This is the problem that generative learning algorithm solves. So basically Bayes theorem, conditional probability and kind of idea about the normal distribution and multivariate normal distribution and as well as I have given you some idea about what is a variance covariance matrix that is when you have multiple variables what actually will have in most of the applications your feature vector would be high dimensional and in that case you need to you need to have a variance covariance matrix that is the variances of the features and the correlation among the features will tell you what are the covariances among the features. So that variance covariance matrix will play a, a key role in getting uh, or running this kind of algorithm. But of course, most people use logistic regression because, uh, but on the other hand, there are advantages and disadvantages. If you use Gaussian distribution, then it is very efficient in terms of estimation, computation. But on the other hand, in case of logistic regression, it may give you good result when the Gaussian assumption, that is, the, you are assuming that the feature distribution is normal. It may not be true. If the assumption is not true, then possibly logistic regression will give you a better classifier. But in case the assumption is true, this Gaussian distribution based classification will give you a better classifier. So, but it is highly computationally efficient. That's why in real life situations, still people use this 
the linear discriminant function or Gaussian distribution based classifier, which is often called the generative learning algorithm. So any question I, I can take if you have any question. I know I have exceeded the time a lot because it was impossible to cover in three hours. Any, any question? No, sir. sir. <laughs> because I think this, this part, the probability part also, I have to go very fast and assuming that you have some knowledge about these distributions, but I don't know. Okay, so uh, Sharna, you you were you were trying to say something. Uh, no, sir, I don't have any doubts. I understood everything. For oh, you, but okay, good. That's good. Okay, in that case, thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Thank sorry you. I had to go fast. I'm sorry for that because uh, this is this is otherwise I can't touch upon all these concepts if I didn't go fast. Sir. Okay. Huh? So just a small request. Ha uh ha -huh. Sir, in the due course, if we have any doubts, uh, is that uh, can we contact you, sir, through some means? So I I will uh, I have my email address. I can write here right now. You can contact me in this. Send an email. This is T A T H A G A T A Tathagata at the rate I I M A dot sc dot in so this is my email address okay sir thank you so thank you professor bandopadhyay uh -huh. so uh, <laughs> it was indeed a pleasure uh, to listen you and to to watch you observe i mean yeah, to attend your class uh, yeah, we understand that uh, the time uh, that we managed to squeeze out in the schedule was really, really, uh, I mean, not adequate to, to address uh, this whole thing, the whole concepts. But I mean, still, I mean, uh, I, I believe, I mean, it was, it was a great experience for all of us. And if required, and uh, what we can do for the students, you can uh, put your uh, you can send email with all your queries uh, so we will soon share a email id with you you already have professor bandopadhyay's email uh, id directly you can do it uh, with him or for the other classes also we are going to uh, put one common email id where you can put your all queries and we can route it to the respective faculties and then we can come back to addressing those points so thank you, uh, Shurupendu. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's all for today. Uh, tomorrow we will be having our first class at three, uh, three p.m. Uh, it will be on language modeling by Professor Sonma Chakraborty, Triple IT Delhi. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.